Chapter 1. The Science of Electricity and Electronics Objectives After studying this chapter, you will be able to identify the relationship between elements and compounds, construct a model of an atom, discuss the concepts of atomic weight and atomic number, state the law of charges and explain it using several examples, explain what is meant by electric current, voltage and resistance, Describe the two theories of current direction. Distinguish the conductors, insulators, and semiconductors. And state and explain Ohm's law. Key words and terms in this chapter. The following words and terms will become important pieces of your electricity and electronics vocabulary. So look for them as you listen to this chapter. Alternating current. Amper, atom, conductor, coulomb, current, direct current, electromotive force or EMF, electron, element, insulator, neutron, Ohm's law, Ohm, potential difference, proton, resistance, semiconductor, volt, and voltage. We are fortunate to live in an age in which the opportunity exists to study the electron. New discoveries, developments, and applications in electronics occur almost daily. These open and promising vista these open a promising vista of unlimited opportunities for the creative scientists as well as for the skilled technician. We are living in a truly electronic age. 1.1 The Nature of Matter Everything in the universe is made of matter. Matter can be defined as anything that occupies space or has mass. Matter can be found in the form of solids, liquids, and gases. However, these states are subject to relative temperatures. Water is usually found in liquid form, yet water can be readily changed to a solid or a vapor form by changing its temperature. Matter can also be described by color, taste, and hardness, but these are only observable characteristics. They may not truly identify a substance. To truly identify a substance, the substance must be broken down into its smallest parts. The substance must be described in terms of its atomic structure. Only then can it truly be defined as its behavioral characteristics identified. A substance has been broken down to its purest form. When breaking it down further, change will change its atomic characteristics. This form is called an element. There are over 100 elements. Most of these elements occur naturally in our universe. Some of the elements do not occur naturally, but have been created in laboratories. Some common examples of naturally occurring elements are iron, copper, gold, aluminum, carbon and oxygen. Figure 1-1 is a periodic table. This table lists all of the known elements and describes them in the scientific terms that make them each unique. If two or more of these elements are mixed together, a compound is created. A compound can be reduced to its individual elements. An element can be reduced to its atomic structure. If the atomic structure is reduced, that element is changed to a different element. Molecule on the atom. If a crystal of a table salt is cut in half, the result is two smaller crystals of common salt. The composition of the salt crystal does not change. It is simply smaller. Salt is a chemical compound composed of two different elements. The elements are sodium and chlorine. Each of these elements, sodium and chlorine, are deadly poisons to the human body. But when combined, sodium and chlorine become the harmless compound known as common table salt. See figure 1-2.
If it were possible for you to smash that crystal of salt into its smallest possible piece, you would have one molecule of salt. A molecule is the smallest part of a compound that still, that still retains its, all of the characteristics of that compound. If you reduce that single molecule of salt into, the, into its next smallest form, it is no longer salt. It is now broken down into different parts. These two parts are the basic elements, sodium and chlorine. If you have not, you have now created poisons out of the normally harmless salt. But do not worry. We have never known salt to be reduced at the dinner table. The smallest form of an element is known as the atom. The word atom is derived from the Greek word meaning indivisible. The atom is so small that it is difficult to visualize. If we attempted to fill a matchbox with atoms at a rate of 10 million per second, it would take over a billion years to fill the box. The atom is the smallest form any material can assume without changing its characteristics. See figure 1-2, excuse me, 1-3 for a chart an illustration showing the relationships of matter, compounds, elements, molecules, and atoms. Again, figure 1-3. Electrons, protons, and neutrons. To understand the mystery of electricity and especially the characteristics of solid state electronics, we must have a basic understanding of the structure and forces that make up the atom. Physicists have discovered that atoms are composed of many minute particles. We will be concerned with only three basic parts of the atom. The structure of the atom, figure 1-4, is similar to our solar system. In our solar system, the planets, Earth, Venus, Mars, etc. revolve around the Sun, the planets whirl around, the sun in their orbits suspended in space by the effects of centrifugal force pushing them away from the sun and gravitational attraction pulling them toward the sun. In an atom the sun's place is taken by the nucleus in the center. Electrons whirl around this nucleus while planets are held in place with gravity electrons are held in place in their orbits by their attraction to the nucleus over overcoming the centrifugal force the electron orbit in the orbiting around the nucleus display a negative charge the nucleus displays a positive charge because because it is composed of positively positively charged protons and neutrally charged neutrons that are neither negative or positive the number of electrons and protons that make up a particular atom are usually equal in number. This equal number creates a canceling effect between the negative and the positive charges. The atomic structure of each element can be described as having a fixed number of electrons in orbit. Examples of the atomic structure of two common elements are displayed in figure 1-5. All elements are arranged in the periodic table of elements according to their atomic number. The atomic number of an element refers to the number of protons or electrons that make up an atom of that element. The order of elements may also be arranged by atomic weight. The atomic weight of an element refers to the approximate number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Referring to figure 1-1, note that the atomic weight of hydrogen is 1, or scientifically 1.008, and its atomic number is 1. The atomic weight of oxygen is 16, its atomic number is 8. Ionization. Usually, an atom remains in its normal state unless energy is added by some exterior force, such as heat, friction, or bombardment by other electrons. 
When energy is added to an atom, the atom becomes excited. If the exterior force is of sufficient strength, electrons in the atom's outer rings or orbits can leave their orbit. How tightly bound these outer electrons are to an atom depends on the element and the number of electrons in the outer orbit. If electrons leave the outer orbit, an atom, the atom becomes out of balance electrically. This concept is extremely important and will be repeated throughout this book and in your studies of electrical phenomena. When the electron leaves the outer orbit, the atom becomes ionized. Figure 1-6, an ionized atom is electrically unbalanced. An atom that loses an electron from its outer orbit has more protons or positive particles in the nucleus than electrons or negative particles in orbit around the atom. The atom becomes a positive ion and displays positively charged characteristics. When an atom gains an, an extra electron, it becomes a negative ion. Negative ions display negatively charged characteristics. The electron that has broken out of its orbit is negatively charged. This concept of negative, negative and positive ions is a key building block to understanding electronic theory. One point two static electricity. The word static means at rest. Electricity can be at rest. The generation of static electricity can be demonstrated in many ways. When stroking the fur of a cat, you will notice that its fur is attracted to your hand. As you bring your hand back over the cat, you will also hear a crackling sound. If this is, sun, if this is done at night, you may see tiny sparks. The sound is caused by the discharge of static electricity. When we stroke the fur with our hand, the friction between the cat's fur, fur and our hand excites the atoms. Some atoms lose electrons while others gain electrons. The sparks are created as the atoms attempt to neutralize themselves by gaining back the lost electrons. You can generate a static electric charge by walking across a wool or nylon rug. A wool or nylon rug with plastic soled shoes. After walking across such rug, you will receive a surprising experience of discharging several thousand volts of static electricity to a metallic object such as a door handle. This condition is especially present on cold winter days when the humidity is quite low. You can also experience a similar discharge when sliding across a seat of a car covered with certain types of upholstery. The friction of your clothing against the seat leads to a discharge when you touch the earth and the metallic frame of the car at the same time. Law of Charges One of the fundamental laws in the study of electricity is the Law of Charges. The Law of Charges states that like charges repel, like charges repel each other and unlike charges attract each other. Again, the Law of Charges states that like charges repel each other and unlike charges attract each other. The power of attraction can be seen when you run a comb through your hair several times. The comb will attract some of the hair toward itself because of the unbalanced electrical charge created by the friction between the hair and the plastic comb. Experiment 1-1 demonstrating the law of charges. These tests demonstrate 
the law of charges. The materials needed are two strands of suspended pin pith balls, one vulcanite rod, one piece of fur, one glass rod, and one piece of silk. Step one is to negatively charge the vulcanite rod with the piece of fur. Step two is to bring the rod close together to the hanging pith ball. Step three is to observe that the ball is first attracted to the rod because of unlike charges. When the ball touches the rod, it is immediately repelled. Continue to attempt to touch the pith ball with the vulcanite rod. Examine exhibit 1-1A. Why has the pith ball attracted, acted this way? 4. Recharge the vulcanite rod and touch it to the second pith ball. You now have two negatively charged pith balls. Bring the two pith balls near each other. Do your observations. Match those of exhibit 1-1B. 6. Charge up the glass rod by rubbing it with a piece of silk. Touch the glass rod to one of the pith balls. Leave the other negatively charged. 7. Bring the two pith balls near each other. Do your observations match those of exhibit 1-1C? If so, explain why you have just observed using the law of charges. Copy machines. There are many different copying machines available today. The copying method explained here is based upon the xerography system of copying. The term xerography is derived from the Greek zeros and graph, meaning dry writing. Xerography process uses powder toner, heat, light, electrostatics, and photoelectric phenomena to produce a copy. Recall that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. Now let's introduce a new electrostatic principle. When a strong beam of light strikes a positive, positively charged area or surface, the light protons will dissipate the positively charged surface areas. Photons exhibit a negatively charged characteristic. This is the underlying principle of Xerography. The original document is placed face down on the glass top of the copy machine. A positive charge is introduced on the drum surface and a negative charge is placed on the blank paper. As the drum rotates, a strong light source is moved along the glass just below the original. The light source is directed toward the original and then reflected back from the white areas through a system of optical lenses. The original document absorbs the lights in the dark areas and reflects the light from the white and or lighter areas. Shades of gray or colors that are seen as gray are partially reflected. The reflected light is directed toward the positively charged drum area through the optical lenses. The positive, the positive charge of the drum on the drum surface is neutralized by the light. Photon energy is negative. The areas not affected by the lights are left with a positive charge on the surface of the drum. The toner is dispersed on the drum and is attracted to the remaining positively charged areas. The negatively charged paper passes under the drum transferring the toner to the paper. The toner is fused to the paper as it passes by a heater. The paper is ejected to the outside collection tray. A color copier uses the same principles as described above except it makes the use of color filters and four shades of toner. The four shades of toner are magneto, cyan, yellow, and black. These four colors are mixed to produce the different colors of the on the original. The light and optic systems 
use color filters to transfer the image to the roller and add the color toner in stages. Other refinements of copier systems include the use of electronics and advanced optical lens systems. The size of the copy can be enlarged or reduced by adjusting the distance between the optical lens and the image. Lightening or darkening the copy is achieved by changing the intensity of the light beam. Electronic counters are used to indicate the number of copies needed. Diagnostic circuits can also be used to indicate conditions such as paper jams, low toner, or an empty paper tray. Many machines can switch between applications such as copying, faxing, scanning, and printing. Advances in design also allow the user to print on different types of materials, including mailing labor labels, transparencies, and even envelopes. Some machines print simultaneously on both sides of the paper reducing printing time and paper jams. Another experiment, experiment 1-2, examining electrical induction and conduction. These two short tests examine the law of charges using electrical induction and conduction. The materials include one electroscope, one vulcanite rod, and one piece of fur. One, quickly rub the vulcanite rod with the fur. You have just placed a negative charge on the rod. Electrons have been transferred to the rod from the fur by friction. Two, bring the charged rod close but, not, but do not touch the electroscope. The leaves in the electroscope expand. Three, move the rod away from the electroscope. The leaves drop back, drop back down. Four, examine exhibit 1-2A. Can you explain what you've just observed? Five, recharge the vulcanite rod, rod with the fur. Six, touch the ball on the electroscope with the rod Observe that the leaves in the electroscope expand. 7. Move the rod away from the electroscope. Observe that the leaves do not drop back down. 8. Examine exhibit 1-2b. Can you explain why the leaves behaved differently in this test? Discuss the concepts of induction and conduction with your instructor. The Coulomb. The force of attraction and repulsion of charged particles was studied by the French scientist Charles A. Coulomb because an atom and electrons in, a, in particular are so very small, a charge of a few electrons, say a dozen, is almost impossible to measure. Consequently, Coulomb developed a practical unit for measurement of an amount of electricity it is known as the Coulomb. One Coulomb represents approximately 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons, while the Coulomb is used to describe the flow of electricity. It is not to be used, it is not used to describe static charges. It is impractical to describe the very small difference in charges between two bodies using values so large. Electrostatic fields. The field of force surrounding a charged body is called the electrostatic field or dielectric field. The field can exhibit a positive or negative charge depending on a gain or loss of electrons. Two charged masses are shown in figure 1-7. Lines represent electrostatic fields of opposite polarity and the attractive force existing between the masses. In figure 1-8, two charged masses are shown with like polarities. A repulsive force exists 
between the charged masses due to the electrostatic fields. The field is strongest very close to the charged body. The field strength diminishes at a distance inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Figure 1-9 illustrates the concept of strength being inversely proportional to the square of the distance. When two electrostatic fields are joined together, the electrons flow from one from the mass with an excess of electrons to the mass that has that has a need of electrons. Figure 1-10 illustrates this principle. The excess electrons from the body that is negatively charged to the positively charged body that has the electron deficiency. This transfer of electrons can be accomplished by touching the two bodies together or by connecting them with a material that supports the flow of electrons between the two bodies. This connecting material is known as a conductor because it conducts electricity. Induction Charges can be transferred in two ways. One way is by direct contact when a charged body such as a glass rod touches another body such as a, the top of an electroscope. The electroscope takes on part of the charge of the rod. Another way of transferring charge is by induction. A charge is induced by bringing a charged object near another object. The glass rod need only be brought near the top of the electroscope to charge it. When an object is charged by induction, the object takes, the, takes on the opposite charge as the rod. When the rod touches the object, the object takes the same charge as the rod. Refer back to experiment 1-2. Static electricity applications. The principles of static electricity are used in industry to produce to reduce air pollution. One piece of equipment used in reducing pollution is called the electrostatic precipitator. Most precipitators are divided into two parts, a charging section and a collecting section. The charging section can be designed in many different ways. It can be an assembly of parallel rods or wires a screen pattern or bank of piping. Regardless of the physical design, the electrical principle is the same in all cases. Figure 1-11 illustrates the operation of the electrostatic precipitator. A grid of electrodes is installed into the stream of pollutants. The stream of pollutants. The electrodes are charged between 45,000 and 75,000 volts, forming an ionized field or a corona around the around each electrode. A corona is an area of ion or static charge surrounding a high voltage conductor. The pollution particles become negatively charged as they pass through the corona. The negatively charged particles are then attracted to the positively charged collection plates. After the collection plates become laden with pollution particles they must be cleaned. This principle of removing particles or pollutants from the air is used in, indus in industries such as concrete, paper, chemical, and coal-fired power generation. The application of electrostatic of electrostatics is also gaining popularity in residential use. Electrostatic filters are a part of the latest air conditioning systems. The principle of attraction and repulsion is also applied within the painting industry and in the manufacture of sandpaper. The painting industry sprays a positively charged mist of paint onto a negatively charged surface such as the panels of an automobile. This procedure reduces the amount of overspray and saves paint. The sandpaper industry charges the backing paper with a positive static charge and the silica crystals, sand or some other abrasive, 
with the negative charge. The result is an even spread of granules over the entire surface of the paper. Basic electrical circuit. A basic electrical circuit consists of three main parts, a voltage source, a load, and conductors. In figure 1-12, a basic circuit is illustrated. This circuit consists of a battery as the source of electrical energy, a lamp as the electrical load, and two wires as the conductors connecting to the battery uh, connecting the battery to the lamp. In the source of the circuit, the battery, a chemical reaction takes place that results in ionization. This ionization produces an excess of electrons, negative charge, and a depletion of electrons, a positive charge. The battery has two terminals. These terminals are connection points for the two conductors. One terminal is marked with a plus sign and the other a negative sign. These two markings are referred to as polarity markings. Not all electrical devices have polarity markings. However, the when polarity is a critical issue, it will be marked on the device. The proper polarity must be followed to avoid damage to equipment and or personnel. Lesson in safety. There will be occasions when you become confused while working on an electrical project and with unfamiliar devices. Anytime you are uncertain about connecting any electrical device, check with your instructor, manager, or expert in the field. Damage from an improperly connected circuit is usually instantaneous and cannot be reversed. A load is created when the electrical energy produced in a circuit is converted to some other form of energy such as heat, light, or magnetism. The load in the sample in the simple circuit in figure 1-12 is a lamp that produces light. The source and the load should match according to the voltage rating. If the lamp is rated at 6 volts, then the battery should also be rated at 6 volts. If the battery is rated at, at a lower voltage rating, the lamp will appear dim or will not light. If the battery is rated at much higher voltage, the lamp will be damaged by the excess electrical energy. The conductors we are using are two copper wires covered with a plastic insulation coating. The copper, the copper wire provides a path through which the electrical energy can flow. While the plastic coating restricts the electrical energy to the copper wire, this makes the conductor pathway safe for personnel. This completes the description of the basic components of a circuit in which electrical energy is channeled by way of electrical conductors through a device, through a device where it is then converted to some useful form. Voltage. Ionization can be caused by forces such as heat, light, magnetism, chemical action, or mechanical pressure. This results in the creation of an electrical voltage. What is voltage? Voltage is the force behind electron flow. It is the simple circuit just described. The battery was the source of electrical energy. This battery has a rating of 6 volts. The volt, written also as V, is the electrical unit used to express the amount of electrical pressure present or the amount of electrical force produced by chemical action inside of the battery. The term volt voltage is used to express the amount of electrical force in much the same way we use horsepower to express the amount of mechanical force for an automobile. Electrical pressure or voltage can also be expressed as potential, potential difference, or as electromotive force or EMF. 
For our purposes, these terms mean the same thing. Voltage is usually represented by the capital letter E or V. Current. Electrical current is the flow of electrons. The amount of electrons flowing past any given point in one second is rated in the electrical unit Amper or capital A. The Coulomb is a quantity of electrons. The Amper describes the rates of flow of the electrons past any given point in, in a circuit. One Amper is equal to one Coulomb of charge flowing past a point in one second. Compare a balloon filled with air to an electrical battery. In figure 1-13, the amount of air molecules in the balloon represent the amount of electrons or coulombs. As pounds per square inch or the PSI of air pressure, the amount of air pressure inside of the balloon is expressed as pounds per square inch PSI of air pressure. In the battery, the amount of electrical pressure inside of the battery is expressed as the voltage rating of the battery. The rates of airflow out of the balloon is similar to electron flow or current from the battery. The current from the battery is the electrical circuit in the electrical circuit. The current from the battery in the electrical circuit is the volume of electrons flow past a given point and is rated in amperes or amps just as the air will continue to escape from the balloon until the balloon is empty. Electron flow will continue as long as there is voltage or electrical pressure present in the battery. Resistance. All electrical circuits have resistance. Resistance is the opposition of the flow of electrons. Resistance is measured in ohms and the electrical symbol for ohm is the Greek letter omega. The resistance values of, elect of elements, the resistance values of elements and compounds differ according to the atomic structure of the material. A good conductor of electricity is anything that permits the free flow of electrons. A poor conductor of electricity is a material that will not permit the free flow of electrons. Extremely poor conductors are referred to as insulators. A semiconductor is a material that limits the flow of free electrons. A semiconductor is considered neither a good conductor nor a poor conductor of electricity. Semiconductor materials are at the very heart of modern electronic applications and will be explored in depth in chapter 17. Some examples of conductors and, and insulators are listed in figure 1-14. Note that the earth can be a good conductor of electricity. There are many factors that determine whether or not the earth will be a good, a good conductor. The earth's conductivity is primarily dependent upon its organic comp composition and on the minerals found in the soil at any given place. The amount of moisture in soil also determines the amount of resistance in the soil. Moisture, moisture can affect the electrical con conducting ability of many materials. It can even cause an insulator to become a good conductor. Take wood as an example to illustrate this point. When wood is dry, it is classified as an insulator, but when it wood becomes wet or moist, it behaves more like a semiconductor. It is the outer ring of an atom that determines whether an element is a good or poor conductor. If the outer ring has only one electron, that electron can be freed from its orbit rather easily by an outside force. If there are many electrons in the outer orbit, the electrons are held tighter in orbit and they are harder to free from the atom. Elements that do not readily give up an electron are insulators. Figure 1-15 is an illustration of the copper atom. 
Notice how this atom has only one electron in its outer orbit. This electron can easily be freed by an outside force. Copper is an excellent conductor of electricity. Current, AC, and DC. There are two types of electrical current, DC or direct current, and AC, alternating current. The difference between these currents is how they flow through an electrical circuit. Direct current flows in only one direction through an electrical, electrical circuit. An example of direct current is a standard battery. The battery has a set polarity, positive and negative terminals, and will produce an electric current in only one direction. On the other hand, alternating current, as its name implies, flows in both directions. First, it flows in one direction and then it reverses its flow to the opposite direction. See figure 1-16. There are no positive or negative polarity markings in alternating current because the polarity changes so rapidly in the typical AC electrical circuit. The terms cycle and hertz are used to describe how fast the current is alternating or changing direction in the circuit. A 60 cycle AC circuit operating at 60 hertz changes direction 120 times per second. This is the standard for AC in the United States. Conventional current flow versus electron flow theory. Approximately 200 years ago, scientists theorized that electricity had both positive and negative polarities. At the time, they arbitrarily decided that electrical current flowed from positive to negative. While it was never actually proven as fact, this theory was accepted for quite some time. This theory is known as the conventional current flow theory. As our knowledge of science progressed and with the discovery of the atom and semiconductor electronics, it became apparent that the conventional current flow theory was incorrect. It is widely accepted that it is the electrons that actually move flowing from negative to positive, not from positive to, to negative. This newer theory is known as the electron flow theory. The emergence of this new theory caused a controversy that still, ex is, uh, that still is in existence today. For over 150 years, all circuit designs have been based upon the old conventional current flow theory. Many circuits and devices still used today are based on the conventional theory. This text uses the convention that will be that will make the concepts in each example more easily, most easily understood. Understood. Most of the figures in this text show electron flow regardless of which theory is used to explain the phenomena of electronics the most important point is that the correct polarity must be maintained when building circuits with devices that require a definite polarity examine each example for polarity markings see figure 1-17 series and parallel series and parallel parallel are two important concepts they must be learned early to fully understand the next few chapters. There are two ways there are two ways a component can be connected in a circuit, either series or parallel. Figure 1-18 and figure 1-19 illustrate the two types of connections. The circuit in figure 1-18 has three lamps connected to a battery. In this circuit, there is only one path over which the electrons can flow. When the electrons only have one circuit path to flow, that circuit is called a series circuit. The lamp are said to be wired in series with respect to each other. In figure 1-19, there are three lamps connected in parallel. In this circuit, there are three different paths for electrons to follow from battery terminal to battery terminal. 
Both the series and parallel circuits have advantages and disadvantages. These will be thoroughly cover covered in later chapters in this text. For now, be able to readily distinguish between the two types of circuits. Fire safety. The possibility of fire is always a threat in an, in an electronics lab or laboratory. When working with electrical circuits, you should have a basic understanding of fire extinguisher types and know how to use them. See figure 1-20. Note, always follow your teacher's instructions concerning the fire procedures in the classroom as well as in the lab area. Be sure to know the location of all fire extinguishers in relation to your classroom, lab, and lab area. Be sure to know the exit procedure in case of a fire. Fire extinguishers are divided into the following five classes. Class A includes ordinary materials such as paper, wood, cardboard, and most plastics. Class B includes flammable liquids such as gasoline, kerosene, oil, and common combustible solvents. Class C includes energized electrical equipment, appliances, fuse boxes, and other electrical devices. Class D includes combustible metals such as magnesium, sodium, potassium, and titanium. Class K, class K includes kitchen fires typically caused by cooking, grease, and oils. Some fire extinguishers are designated with a combination of letters. For example, a fire extinguisher with all of the letters A, B, and C would be suitable for a class A, B, or C fire. Water extinguishers are only appropriate for Class A fires. Class A uses water or a liquid that reacts violently with the other types of fires and as a result could cause the fire to spread rather than extinguish. The acronym PASS explains the proper procedure for using the fire extinguisher. PASS or P-A-S-S was developed to match the recommended procedures by the National Fire Protection Agency and FPA for fire extinguisher use. While standing approximately six to eight feet from the fire, you should follow the procedure as outlined. P for pull the pin, A for aim low at the base of the fire, S for squeeze the handles together slowly to discharge the fire extinguisher, S sweep the nozzle from side to side moving carefully toward the fire toward the fire while keeping the discharge aimed at the base of the fire ohm's law 1 1.4 Ohm's law. Electrical circuits are built correctly that are built correctly will be in perfect electrical balance. The current through the resistance is directly related to the amount of electrical pressure or voltage applied to the current to the circuit. This balance of three factors voltage, resistance, and current can be expressed by Ohm's law. Ohm's law is named for the 19th century German scientist George Simon Ohm. The relationship expressed by Ohm's law is the basic formula that is used more extensively than any other electrical formula you will encounter in your study of electricity and electronics. It is the basis of more for, mo for most of the other formulas. It is the basis for many of the other formulas and electrical relationships studied in this text. Ohm's law states that the current measured in amperes in a circuit is equal to the applied voltage divided by the resistance. Ohm's law is expressed in three formulas described below. Learning Ohm's Law is illustrated in figure 1-21. To see how easy it is to use, simply cover the unknown quantity with your finger 
and the remaining letters will show the solving equation. For example, when the voltage is the unknown quant quantity, cover the E with your finger, and then I and R remain. Thus, E equals I times R, or voltage equals current times resistance. Now, cover the I with your finger, and the E over the R remains, thus I equals E divided by R, or current equals voltage divided by resistance. Let's look at, a, at an application of Ohm's law. In figure 1-22, a lamp is a resistance of, has a resistance. A lamp with a resistance of 4 ohms has been connected to a 12 volt source. The current is unknown. By applying Ohm's law, you can determine the current to be equal to 3 amperes. In figure 1-23, a 24 volt ohm, a 24 ohm resistance heater works most effectively when using a 5 amp of current. How much voltage is required for the heater to operate at 5 amps? By applying Ohm's law, the amount of electrical pressure needed to conduct 5 amps through a 4 to through a 24 ohm ohm resistance is 120 volts. In figure 1-24, a resistor is connected to a 24 volt source. A meter that measures current indicates there are 3 amperes. Present in the circuit, again by applying Ohm's law, the amount of resistance needed to limit the current value to 3 amperes is found to be 8 ohms. The application of Ohm's law may seem strange at first, but with a little practice it will become second nature to you. Electrical prefixes. Measurement of electrical quantities vary from small amounts to large amounts. To make it easier to label electronic parts and equipment, and to make electronic calculations easier, a system of prefixes is used when expressing electrical quantities. Without this system, we would need to use an excessive amount of zeros to the left of the right, to the left and the right of the decimal point. Figure 1-25 is a listing of the most common prefixes used in the electronics industry today. When an electrical quantity such as a voltage is written, it is expressed in units such as kilovolt, megavolt, millivolt, microvolts to avoid using an awkward numerical form. For example, the quantity 5 million volts would be written as 5 MB. If the quantity was 0 0.005 or 5 thousandths of a volt, it would be written as 5 millivolt or 5 M, a small m, uh, capital V. It is important to note the use of the uppercase letters and duplicate lower case letters in, the, in these units. When voltage is expressed with a capital letter M, it represents millions of volts, but when the voltage is expressed using a lower case M, it represents the fractional units of thousands. Summary. Matter is anything that occupies space or has mass. Elements are basic or pure forms of matter. Compounds are mixtures or combinations or of two or more elements. Atoms are the simplest form or are the simplest forms of an element still having the unique characteristics of that element. Molecules are the simplest form of a compound still having the unique characteristics of that compound. Neg the negatively charged particle of the atom is the electron and the positively charged particle is the proton. Like charges repel each other while unlike charges attract each other. Induction occurs when a charged body is brought close to another body. 
the coulomb is the quantity of electrons or 6.24 times 10 to the 18th power of electrons current is the most current is the movement of electrons in a conductor voltage is the force behind the electrons it moves them along a conductor resulting in current ohm's law can be stated in three ways e equals i times r i equals e divided r and r equals e divided i there are two types of current ac current or alternating current and dc current or direct current Correct polarity must be observed when connecting electrical devices. And this is the end of chapter one. The Science of Electricity and Electronics A note from the instructor Jerome Barnes Read by Hector Bello Lesson 1 In order to emerge yourself in the field of electricity and electronics you must first understand the science of electricity and electronics Matter is anything that occupies space and can be found in various forms, solids, liquids and gases Therefore everything is made of matter Matter can be described in various ways but the true identity of a substance is revealed when it's broken down into its purest, fo purest form. This is known as an element. There are 100 element, elements, over 100 elements, which are displayed on the periodic table. The smallest form of the element, known as an atom, is most important to the electrical and electronics world. An atom is made up of three important parts, electrons, protons, and neutrons. Electrons are negative protons are positive and neutrons are neutral. The nucleus of an atom has an equal amount of protons and neutrons in its inner ring. The outer ring is where the electrons circle around the inner ring. If you add some type of energy it will cause the atoms to become excited and the electrons in the outer ring can leave its outer orbit. Electrons that leave the orbit can cause the atom, the atom to become ionized or electrically unbalanced. When these electrons leave, it causes the atom to, be, to become more positive, a positive ion because of the greater amount of protons left, greater than the electrons that is. If the atom gains an electron, it is known as a negative ion because the electrons are greater than the protons in the atom that is the concept of positive and negative charge is the foundational key to electricity and electronics again the concept of positive and negative charge is the foundational key of electricity and electronics a good example of this concept is when you take two magnets and put them together see on the next page magnets have two poles a north and a south pole. In the field we refer to the north pole as positive and the south pole as negative. If like charges are put together such as negative to negative or positive to positive they will repel. If opposite charges are put together negative to positive they will attract. This force of attraction and repulsion is used to describe the flow of electricity and is known as Coulomb's. 
Again, this force of attraction and repulsion is used to describe the flow of electricity and is known as Coulomb's. These magnets, as the ones shown is in figure D, page 1-4, create an electrostatic field where the electrons will flow from the mass with the greater amount to the one with the least amount. Again, the magnets create an electrostatic field where the electrons will flow from the mass with the greater amount to, to, the, to the one with the great, least amount. This is achieved by simply putting the two magnets together. You won't be able to see it, but you will be able to feel the magnets pushing, pushing away or coming together. As they come closer together, you will feel the field strength get stronger. As you push them apart, you will feel the field strength weaken. The materials inside these two magnets are conductors because they conduct electricity. The phenomenon described above was demonstrated utilizing direct contact. Another way to transfer charges is by induction. This is accomplished by bringing a charged object near another. A good example would be using a battery to power a light. Now that we have the basic concept of electrical theory, out of the way. Let's move forward into learning about electrical circuits. The basic electrical circuit will have three parts. Notice I said basic because as we go further into the course we'll add more to the circuits but for now we will concentrate on the basic circuit. The three main parts are voltage, a load, a conductor, and a conductor. The voltage in this case will be supplied by a battery. The load will be a simple lamp or something we are trying to get to work. The conductor is, is the wire we use to hook up, to hook the battery to the lamp or to transfer the current. When you take one side of the battery and wire it to the lamp and wire the other side of the lamp back to the switch and the other side of the switch to the other side of the battery, the electrical energy will cause the lamp to produce light. Always remember the size of your load or lamp, in this case, and the, and the source, which is the battery. Uh, they are the same. The size of the load, and the, the load and the source are the same. If not, you can cause the circuit to malfunction or not work at all. With the knowledge of a simple circuit, we can now move on onto the vital, vital parts of, an, of all electrical circuits, which you will see throughout your career in electronics, voltage, current, and resistance. Voltage is the force behind electron flow, or the difference in potential that causes electrons to flow. Its unit of measure is volts, which is expressed by the letters E or V. When voltage is produced, it can, it can either be AC or DC, depending upon the power supply that's alternating current or direct current if the power supply is a battery you will read dc volts if the power supply is a transformer you will read ac volts these types of voltage readings will become clearer to you in the next chapter current current is the flow or movement of electrons its unit of measurement is amperes which is represented by the letter i it flows from negative to positive. Like voltage, like voltage, current has two types, AC and DC. AC or alternating, alter, alternating current flows in two directions. DC or direct current flows in one direction and is usually supplied by a battery. The similarities between the voltage and the current types provide a hint to the type of current it is. If it is DC, the voltage and current will indicate DC. If it is AC, the current and voltage 
will indicate AC. Resistance is the opposition to the current. It is measured in ohms, which is represented by the Greek letter omega. Resistive values vary among the types of material used to build them. A good piece of material that allows current to flow is known as a conductor. A bad piece of material that doesn't allow current to flow through it is known as an insulator. A good example of both is a piece of wire See below, the inside, the inside consists of the copper piece that allows the current to flow. The outside consists of the material used to cover the wire and current will not flow through it. Here are a few other examples of conductors and insulators such as aluminum, iron, steel, copper, rubber, and plastic. Copper is the most widely used conductor in wires throughout the electrical world. Rubber and plastic are the most used insulators. There are only two ways components can be wired in an electrical circuit, series and parallel. Again, there are only two ways components can be wired in an electrical circuit, series and parallel. In a series circuit, figure 1-1.8, the electrons only have one path. For current to flow. In a parallel circuit you have multiple paths for current to flow. There is another type of circuit that combines both series and parallel, parallel into one. It is called a combination circuit, see below. As your electronics knowledge increases, you will see this type of circuit has both components. Basic combination circuit, page 1-6, see the figure. As shown above in the figure, if a circuit is built correctly, it will have a, perfectly, a perfect electrical balance between current, voltage, and resistance. This balance is known as Ohm's law. See the figure below, page 1-6. Using Ohm's law, if you know the value of any two, the third value can be found. The following symbols are utilized in expressing Ohm's law. E for voltage, I for current, and R for resistance. I recommend that you use a calculator to figure out, to figure out values in Ohm's law. The best way is to look at the formula shown in the diagram on the left by viewing the horizontal line as a division problem and the vertical line as a multiplication. Use your finger to cover the value that you are solving for. If you want voltage, then the E is covered and it leaves I and R with a vertical line between them. So you multiply I times R current times resistance which equals your voltage if you want to find I you cover it and it leaves E and R with a horizontal line between them with E being on top so you divide E divided you divide E by R which equals your current You can do this, you can do the same for whatever value you are solving for. Take a few minutes and apply some values to different variables to sharpen your skills to get a clear picture of the relationship between the three. Example, if voltage or E equals 10 and resistance equals 5, what is I? That would be 2. 
to Wentz. As we bring the lesson to a close, there is one other area I want to touch on. In the world of electricity and electronics, you will deal with very small numbers and very large numbers. A prefix system was created to make it easier to deal with such numbers. Shown, to the next, shown on the next page, the easy way to remember the prefixes is by thinking in terms of, zero, of a zero on a number line. If it is to the right, it is going to be represented by a capital letter. If it is to the left, it is going to be represented by a lowercase letter. These letters merely tell you how many zeros go after or before your number. If you want to write 3000, it is written as 3K or 3 kilo. Uh, that's K with a capital K. If you want to write 0 0.003 or 0.3, or excuse me, 3, three uh, thousandths, it is written 3M with a, three, with a M, with a lowercase M. Rem remembering those prefixes are essential in electronics because they will be around as you dive in deep into the profession. Getting through this lesson was not very difficult, but there are a few websites which may be able to help you understand the concepts better. Chapter 2, Basic Instruments and Measurements. Keywords and terms, the following words or terms and terms will become important pieces in your electricity and electronics vocabulary. Look for them as you read this chapter. Ammeter, analog meter, common, D-Arceval or Darceval movement, digital meter, digital multimeter or DMM, field effect transistor or VOM or FET bomb, linear meter scale, multimeter, multiply, multiply resistor, and the National Electric Code. Other words include nonlinear scale, ohm meter, ohms per volt, resolution, root mean square, value or RMS value, schematic, shunt, Volt ohm meter or VOM bomb. Electricity and electronic technicians rely on instru instruments to judge the actions and traits of a circuit precisely. The skillful use of instruments is the mark of a good technician and will enable you to quickly and efficiently troubleshoot a circuit. The student of electricity and electronics must know what he or she is trying to measure and how to measure it. In this chapter, we will discuss the three most common types of meters used today. These meters are the ohm meter, the amp meter, and the volt meter. Each of these meters will be covered thoroughly to give you a basic, the basic skills necessary to continue your studies. Think of an electrical meter as an electronic ruler that is used to measure electrical quantities such as voltage, current, and resistance. The meters you will be using 
come in two formats. There are analog meters and digital meters. Analog meters discussed first in this chapter use a scale with continuous variable values. Digital meters, meters give values discrete in discrete amounts using the units 0 through 9. Digital meters are discussed later in the chapter. 2.1 Basic Analog Meter Movement A common type of meter movement measures current and voltage. It is the Darceval movement or stationary magnet moving coil galvanometer. Figure 2-1 The movement consists of a permanent type magnet and a rotating coil in the magnetic field. An indicating needle is attached to the rotating coil. See Figure 2-2 When a current passes through the moving coil a magnetic field is produced. This field reacts with the stationary field and causes rotation or deflection in the needle, which is attached again to the uh, moving coil. This deflection force is proportional to the strength of the current flowing through the moving coil. When the current ceases to flow, the moving coil is returned to its at rest position by hair springs. These springs are also connected to the meter coil. The deflecting force rotates the coil against the restraining force of these springs. Again, see figure 2-3. Caution. The coil that rotates in the magnetic field is mounted on precision type jewel bearings, much like a fine watch. The dual type bearings and mount, known as a Darcelbar movement, make the instrument very easy to damage if dropped or jarred. Extreme caution should be used when transporting or moving a meter with a Darcelbar type movement. Figure 2-1 in page 34 will show you a phantom view of the Darcival meter movement. When connecting the meter to an electrical circuit, proper polarity must be maintained. The meter is equipped with polarity markings, usually the red plus sign and a black negative sign. Some meters use the abbreviation COM, C -O -M, which stands for common for the negative polarity marking. The meter rotates inside the permanent mag magnet field. If proper polarity is not used, the coil will deflect in the direction opposite to that which is what it was designed. At the very least, the needle will not deflect and there will appear to be no reading. At worst, the situation could possibly damage the meter. So some meters have circuit protection built into them. This protects the meter movement to dam from damage that can be caused by improper connections. Figure 2-3, page 34, you can see a current flowing through the ammeter must be limited by a resistance in the circuit being tested. The iron vein meter movement. The operation of the iron vein meter movement is shown in figure 2-4 in page 35. Two pieces of iron are placed in the hollow core of a solenoid or a coil of wire. When the current passes through the solenoid, both pieces of metal become magnetized with the same polarity. Because like poles repel each other, the two pieces of iron are repelled from each other. One piece of metal is fixed in its position, the other piece of metal pivots. The pivoting piece can turn away from the fixed metal. An indicating needle is attached to the moving vein. The needle is equipped with hair springs so that the vein must move against the spring tension for accurate readings. An applied voltage causes the current flow in the solenoid and creates the magnetic field. The moving vein is repelled 
against the spring according to the strength of the magnetic field. The needle may indicate either voltage or current. It is calibrated for the, mag for the magnitude or average size of the applied voltage or current. When the iron movement when the iron vein movement is used for a voltmeter, a solenoid is commonly wound with many turns of fine wire. The proper multiplier resistance may be used to increase the range of the meter. Multiplier resistance will be talked about shortly. A selector switch is used to select proper ranges. When used as an ammeter for current, the solenoid has a few turns of heavy wire. This is because the coil must be connected in series with the with the circuit and carry the current the circuit current. Regardless of the polarity of the applied voltage or current, the iron vein meter movement always deflects in the same direction. Either AC or DC may be measured with this instrument. Generally, this type of meter is best suited for for high power measurements. Meter scales. The meter scale is used to interpret ampere and voltage values in the linear type. A linear meter scale has evenly spaced marks used to indicate the amount of current flowing or voltage present. In the meter movement, figure 2-5 shows a typical lin linear scale for an and meter. The scale illustrated in figure 2-5 is marked from 0 to 5, with 10 smaller marks between each major numbered marks. To determine the value of each mark between the major divisions, the scale factor, divide the value of the first major division by the number of spaces in that division. The dial of the right of each scale, figure 2-5, is the range selector. The range selector must be correct, correlated to that scale to determine full scale deflection. The formula for scale factor is as follows. Scale factor, value of measured division, and the number of spaces, divided by the number of spaces. Again, scale factor equals to value of measured division divided by the number of spaces. Study figure 2-5. Note that the value of each division changes as the range selector changes. On the scale, the first major division is marked with a 1. In the top example, the range selector is set to 5 amps. This means that the full scale deflection is 5 amps. On this scale, the 1 represents 1 amp. And there are 10 spaces between the 1 and the 0. By dividing 1 by 10, we can conclude that each space is equal to 1 tenth. One -tenth or 0.1 of the first major mark or 0.1 amp. The second example has a full scale deflection equal to 0.5 or 0.5 amperes. Therefore, the major scale markings are equal to 0.1 amper each. Since there are 10 spaces between each major division, each small mark is equal to 0.01 amperes each or 10 milliamps. In the third example, the range selector switch is set to 0 0.05 amps. This makes the full scale deflection equal to, point to 0 0.05 amperes. Each major number division is equal to 0 0.01 amper. Since there are 10 equal spaces between each major division in the scale, each small mark is equal to 0 0.001 amperes or 1 milliamp.
Review questions for section 2.1. Another name for the stationary magnet moving coil meter is the Darson ball, Darson ball movement. Explain how moving coil a moving coil operates. Again, a moving uh, coil of thin wire, uh, which has the needle attached to it, the pointing needle, needle is fixed with uh, a hair spring or hair uh, coil of spring wire or material and the voltage or current is channeled or directed through this thin wire of course using a multiply a resistor to uh, to limit the amount of current or voltage through this thin wire not to damage it and once this voltage or current goes through this thin wire uh, and does through the coil it is magnetized and it creates a reaction with the permanent mag permanent magnet that's affixed to the outside of this rotating coil and depending on the amount of voltage or currents going through it that's how much it will reflect again limited by the coil of hair wire or hairspring so uh, the amount of deflection depends on the amount of current or voltage going through this uh, coil of wire also called a moving coil coil or uh, the, the Darson ball movements a linear meter scale has evenly spaced marks used to indicate circuit values 2.2 ammeter an ammeter measures electrical current in a circuit. The ammeter will usually measure in amperes, milliampers, or microampers, depending on the scale design of the instrument. The coil and the meter movement of an ammeter is wound with many turns of fine wire. If a large current is allowed to flow through this coil, the ammeter will quickly burn out. In order to measure larger, larger current, larger currents, a shunt. A shunt or alternate path is provided for the current for most of the current most of the current flows through the shunt leaving only enough current to safely work the meter movement coil the shunt is a precision resistor connected in parallel with the meter coil the use of shunts is illustrated in figure 2-6 In figure 2-7, you will see the proper way to connect an ammeter to an electrical circuit. The ammeter is connected to, into the circuit. It becomes part of the circuit in order to allow the current to flow through the meter coil. To connect an ammeter to a circuit, one, is usually, one usually has to make an open or disconnect some device in the circuit. This allows you to insert the meter into the circuit. Notice that you're connecting the meter in series with the circuit or device you're trying to measure. Example, the specification of a certain meter movement requires 0.001 ampere or 1 milliampere of current for full scale deflection to the needle. The ohmic, ohmic, the ohmic resistance of the meter movement coil is 100 ohms. Compute the shunt resistor values for a meter that will measure for different ampere ranges the ranges are as follows 0 to 1 milliamp 0 to 10 milliamp 0 to 50 milliamp and 0 to 100 milliamp first calculate the voltage required for full scale deflection on the lowest setting which is 0 to 1 milliamp using ohm's law Voltage or E equals I or full scale current 
times R or resistance of the coil. So voltage is equal to we have the current which is 0 0.001 amp or 1 milliamp times resistance which is 100 ohms. Using Ohm's law voltage equals 0 0.1 volts. The meter will read from 0 to 1 milliamp without a shunt for full scale deflection of 0 0.1 volts. So 0 0.1 volts is required for full scale deflection again. To convert this same meter read to read from 0 to 10 milliamps, a shunt must be connected that will carry 9 tenths of the current. Thus, 9 milliamps of current will travel through the shunt, leaving 1 milliampere to operate the meter. The first step is in the calculation is to determine that 0.1 volt is required for full scale deflection. The shunt is connected in parallel with the coil, so it will have 0.1 volt applied to it. Since 0.1 volt must be applied across the shunt, And the shunt must also account for nine tenths of the current. You can apply Ohm's law to calculate the shunt <coughs> resistance. Excuse me. Again, since 0.1 volt must be applied across the shunt, and the shunt must also account for nine tenths of the current, you can apply Ohm's law to calculate the shunt's resistance. So using Ohm's law, the shunt resistance equals voltage divided current. We know the voltage is 0.1 volt and the amperage or current is 0 0.009 amp or 9 milliamp. So the resistance is 0.1 volt divided 0 0.009 amp, which is 11.1 uh, ohms. The resistance is 11.1 ohms. Again, where did the 0 0.009 amp come from? That is 9 tenths of 10 milliamps, which is 0 .0, uh, 0 0.01 amp. 9 tenths of that is 0 0.009 amp. Where did the 1.1 volt come from? It is established that 0.1 volt must go through the shunt for full deflection. Thus, um, that's what we have as the voltage. The meter will require a shunt with a resistance of value of 11.1 .1 ohms for that example for the 0 to 10 milliamp scale. Figure 2-6 in page 37 shows uh, steps for the voltage for full-scale deflection of the uh, ammeter. Step 1, the voltage that causes the full-scale deflection current is computed. Step 2, the shunt carrier carries 9 tenths of the current. Step 3, the shunt carries 49 50th of the current. And the step 4 carries 99 over 100th of the current. Bottom basic setup of an ammeter with three shunt resistors. A switch selects the range. Figure 2-7 on page 38, an ammeter is always connected in series with the circuit device being measured. The meter must be connected with proper polarity. Step 3. To convert this meter, this is uh, in continuation from page 37 of course. Step 3. To convert this meter for the 0 to 50 milliamp scale, a shunt must be used that will carry 49 50th of the current or 49 milliamp. The computation is the same as in step 2. 
the shunt resistor equals voltage divided current which is oh, um, the same voltage 0.1 volt divided the current which is 0 0.049 amp and this equals to 0 0.04 ohms step 4 convert the meter for the 0 to 100 milliamp scale a shunt must be used that will carry 99 of 100 of the current or 99 milliamps uh, shunt current, excuse me, shunt resistance equals to voltage divided current 0.1 volts divided 0 0.099 amps equals to 1.01 ohms. A shunt with an ohmic, ohmic value of 0 .0, 0, 0.0, excuse me, 1.01 .01 is required for the meter to safely use a 0 to 100 milliamp range. Look again at, zero, uh, at figure 2-6. Notice the switching device used to change the ranges of the meter at the bottom of the figure. The correct scale on the range dial must be used to correspond to the selected range. Caution, there are two important things to remember for the safety of your AND meter. First, an AND meter must always be connected in series with a circuit device or the power supply. Never connect the nanometer in parallel with the power supply or circuit devices. Figure 2-8, as you can see through the meter shunt calculations, the applied voltage to the meter movement coil only required 0.1 volt for full-scale deflection. If a voltage greater than 0.1 is used, it will cause excessive current to flow through the coil. This will result in damage to the coil. To make series connection usually to make series connection usually requires breaking the circuit open or disconnecting the device in order to insert the meter. This allows the current to flow through the meter. The second thing to remember is when current when the current value you are testing is unknown, start at the highest meter range. This way you will not exceed the highest value of the meter scale during reading the circuit, reading of a circuit. As you can see in figure 2-8, the wrong way to connect a ammeter is shown first. The right way in series is shown second. Connecting an ammeter. And some review questions. An ammeter is used to measure current. In order to measure larger current, a shunt or alternate path is provided for the current. An ammeter should always be connected in series with the load. Two point three voltmeter. The same basic meter movement that is used in an ammeter is also used to measure voltage. This is provided providing that the impressed voltage across the coil never exceeds 0.1 volts. The same as computed for full scale deflection. This is important. This is always as computed for full scale deflection. To arrange the meter to measure higher voltages, a multiplier resistor is placed or multiplier resistors are placed in series with the ammeter movement coil using a switch. <clears throat> a meter similar to the meter that measured current is used. Refer to figure 2-9. Volt meters are always connected in parallel in parallel with the device being measured. Example, follow the steps as the multipliers are computed so that the meter can be can measure voltages from 0 to 1 volt, 0 to 10 volts, and 0 to 100 volts, and 0 to 500 volts. Remember that no more than 0.1 volt is allowed across the meter coil at any time. Therefore, a resistor that will cause a voltage drop of 0.9 volts must be placed in series with the meter if the meter is used to measure one volt. Also, the meter will only allow 0 0.001 amp again for full scale deflection. This is the highest current allowed in the coil circuit. The multiply resistor must produce a 0.9 volt drop in this case when a 0 0.001 amp flows through it. 
So the multiply resistor calculation is multiply resistor equals uh, voltage divided current, again, Ohm's law. So in this case, the multiply resistor equals 0.9 volts divided 0 0.001 amp. And the multiply resistor equals to 900 ohms when you calculate that. Again, this is for a zero, a reading of a zero to one volt scale. Step two, to convert zero, zero to 10 volt range, a resistor must be selected to produce a 9.9 .9 volt drop. So the resistor uh, multiplier equals to, using Ohm's law equals to 9.9 .9 volts divided 0 0.001 amp which is equal to 9,900 ohms. To convert, step three, to convert zero to 100 volt range, a resistor must be selected to produce a 99.9 99 .9 volt drop. 99.9 .9 volts comes from one, uh, nine tenths or 99 one hundredths of 100 volts, which is the, the maximum range and 9.99 over 100 from a hundred or 99 one hundredths of 100 is 99.9 .9, which is the volt drop voltage drop required from the resistor multiplier so using ohm's law again the resistor mul multiplier equals to 99.9 .9 volts divided 0 0.001 amp or 99,000 ohms step four zero to 500 volt range calculate the resistor multiplier must cause and the resistor multiplier must cause a 499.9 again 499.9 volt drop again coming from the 500 because we only can allow 0 0.01 volt through the coil through the meter coil so we have to drop 499.9 .9 volts and again using Ohm's law the resistor multiplier equals to 499.9 .9 volts divided 0 0.001 amp or which is equal to 499,900 ohms again a switching device is used to select the correct multiple resistor for the range in use. Read the scale on the dial that corresponds to the range selected. The dial on a meter is generally referred to as the range selector switch. Figure, figure 2-9 on page 39. Step 1, this, the multiplier causes an IR drop or Current resistance drop or of 0.9 volts. Step two, the multiply causes an IR drop of 9.9 volts. 9.9 volts. Step three, the multiply causes an IR drop of 99.9 .9 volts. And step four, the multiply causes an IR drop of 49, 499.9 .9 volts bottom the basic setup of a voltmeter switch is added to select the range caution a voltmeter is always connected in parallel or across the circuit to measure a voltage the circuit does not have to be broken See figure 2-10, page 40. As with the ammeter, when measuring an unknown voltage, always start measuring at the meter with the meter set on its highest range. Adjust downward to the proper range to avoid damage, damaging the meter. In addition, be sure that the leads are connected with the correct, correct polarity. The black lead is negative and the red lead is positive. Figure 2-10, a voltmeter is connected in parallel with the device when taking voltage reading. Voltmeter sensitivity. 
The sensitivity of a voltmeter is a sign of quality. Ohms per volt is the unit of measuring sensitivity. In step four of the previous example, the total resistance of the meter and its multiplier resistance is 499,900 ohms for the multi uh, multiplier resistor plus 100 ohms, which is the meter resistance. So the total resistance is 500,000 ohms. The total amount of resistance in the 500 volt range is equivalent to the following 500,000, again using Ohm's law. 500,000 ohms divided 500 volts equals 100 ohms per volt. That's just a simple division to know how many ohms per volt. Divide ohms by the volts. It gives you 100 ohms per volt. Using Ohm's law, I equals E divided R, or current equals voltage divided resistance. The reciprocal of I equals <laughs> resistance divided voltage. So this is the same as the meter, meter sensitivity. Therefore, the sensitivity is equal to the reciprocal of the current required for full scale deflection. Again, sensitivity of a meter is equal to the reciprocal of the current required for, for full scale uh, deflection for the meter used in the above example. Sensitivity equals one volt equals 0 0.001 ohm, which is the coil resistance, or equals to 1000 ohms per volt. The sensitivity of a meter can be used to gauge the meter quality. A meter that has a quality meter has sensitivity of at least 20,000 ohms per volt. Precision laboratory meters measure as high as 200,000 ohms per volt. Accuracy of the meter is commonly expressed as a percentage, such as 1%. That means that the true value will remain will be within 1% of the scale reading. Another system of rating meters is the accuracy expressed as a percentage of full scale reading. A meter may have a rating of more or less 0.05% or less. In general, the smaller the percentage, the higher the quality of the meter. Noting a circuit. When a voltmeter is connected across a circuit to measure a potential difference, it is in parallel with the load in the circuit.
again when a voltmeter is connected across a circuit to measure the potential difference it is in parallel with the load in the circuit this situation can introduce errors in voltage measurement in meters with low sensitivity this is very common it is very important to keep in mind this in mind in figure 2-11 two 10,000 ohm resistors form a voltage divider circuit across the 10 volt source the voltage drops across r1 and r2 are 5 volts each if a meter with a sensitivity of 1000 volts 1000 ohms per volt on the 10 volt range is used to measure their voltage across r1 the meter resistance will be in parallel with r1 solving Parallel circuits is explained in depth in, in chapter 7. For now, it is enough to know that the addition of this meter cuts the effective resistance of R1 in half. The combined resistance of the meter and R1 is equal to R1 plus Rm or R multiplier, again R1 plus R multiplier or Rm uh, divided by 2, all divided by 2 equals the effective resistance or R effective. Or 10,000 ohms divided 2 equals 5,000 ohms. With the meter connected, the total circuit resistance becomes the R effective plus R2 equals the R total or 5,000 ohms. Plus, plus 10,000 ohms equals 15,000 ohms. Using ohms law, the current can be calculated at approximately 0 0.0067 amps. Using ohms law again, ER1 equals 3.35 volts and ER2 equals 6.7 volts. The meter has caused an error of more than 1 volt due to its shunting effect. To avoid an excess of errors resulting from this effect, a more sensitive meter should be used. In figure 2-12, a 5000 ohms per volt meter is used. In this case, the combined resistance of the meter and R1 equals 8,333 8 ohms. The total circuit resistance is 18,300 ohms using Ohm's law. The current or I is equals to 0 0.0055 amps and E or voltage R1 equals to 4.6 and E R2 or voltage R2 equals to 5.5 volts. An error of an error of 0 0.4 volts still exists. But the increased sensitivity of the meter has reduced the error. Even more costly meters with a sensitivity of 20,000 ohms per volt can reduce the error to an amount that would be barely noticed. Figure 2-12, a sensitive meter gives more accurate readings. Review questions for section 2.3. A voltmeter is used to measure voltage. The measure higher, to measure higher voltages, multimeter res resistors are placed in series with the meter movement coil. A voltmeter is connected in parallel with a device. A black lead of a meter is connected to the negative polarity of the device being red and the red lead is attached to the positive polarity. A quality meter has a sensitivity of at least 20,000 ohms per volt. Explain what is meant by adding a, a circuit as it relates to an electrical meter. Explain what is meant to lo by loading a circuit as it relates to a, an electrical meter. The load remains in the circuit and the meter is placed across the load watching for polarity 2.4 ohm meters a meter to a meter used to measure the value of an unknown resistance is called a ohm meter the same meter movement that was used in the volt and and meter can be used for the ohm meter the voltage source and a variable resistor are added to the ohm meter circuit a series type ohm meter is shown
Figure, <clears throat> figure 2-13 schematic diagram of a series ohm meter. A 3 volt battery is used as the source of the ohm meter. The battery is built into the meter case. The, the meter movement permits only 0.1 volt for a current of 0 0.001 amps for full scale deflection. Therefore, a, multi, a multiplier resistor is placed in series with the meter coil to reduce the voltage applied to the meter coil. So resistance, resistance M or RM equals to voltage divided current. So RM or resistor, resistor movement equals to, to uh, in this case 2.9 volts divided 0 0.001 amps and the RM is equal to 2900 ohms. <clears throat> the 2900 ohm multiplier resistor plus the meter coil resistance is equal to 3000 ohms. Part of this resistance is made up of a variable resistor to allow the total resistance to vary. Because temperature changes or weak batteries can affect the total resistance of the circuit, the ohm meter must be calibrated. Adjust for zero resistance in order to ensure the most accurate reading possible. The knob used adjusting the pointing needle position to zero is usually marked zero adjust or with an omega symbol near it. To use the ohm meter, first short, short the test leads together. This applies a zero ohms across the meter. Adjust the ohms adjustment knob until the needle points at zero. The needle should deflect from its position at rest on the left to the zero resistance indication on the right side of the scale. If the needle does not deflect, it is possible that the battery is dead or extremely weak after the ohmmeter has been calibrated to read zero ohms when the leads are shorted. You can make a reading of an unknown resistance by placing the unknown resistance between the test leads. Caution. Before connecting an ohmmeter to an electrical circuit to read an unknown value, be sure that the circuit is not energized. An energized circuit will damage the meter and can be harmful to you. Electrical energy in a circuit is not needed to operate the meter movement coil and it is and as it is you as it is when using the voltmeter or ammeter. The batteries inside the, the case provide the source of power for the ohmmeter. Connecting the ohmmeter to an energized circuit will apply the circuit voltage directly to the coil and battery, which can result in damage to the meter and, the possi and possible harm to you. A shunt ohmmeter is connected as shown in figure 2-14. In this circuit, the unknown resistance or RX is shunted or connected in parallel across the meter. Low values of Rx cause lower currents through the meter. High values of Rx cause higher high meter currents. When the ohm meter is connected in the shunt position, the indicating needle deflects from left to right in the manner of the ammeter and voltmeter. Zero resistance is on the left. The scale increases from left to right. Figure 2-14 schematic diagram of a shunt ohm meter. Note that the meter reads in the opposite direction of other ohm meters. Ohm meter scales. The resistance value is indicated on the ohm scale, which is a non-linear non scale. A non-linear scale has markings that are not evenly spaced. The non-linear scale factors, factor increases as the needle travels from zero resistance to infinite resistance. In figure 2-15, a typical ohm meter scale is represented. On the right side of the scale is zero. On the left side is infinity. An infinity reading means that the, set, that the resistance value is so high that it exceeds the capabilities of the ohm meter to read it. Notice how the scale factor changes 
along the ohm meter scale. On the right side, the small marks between the numbers 0 and 2 represent 0.2 ohms each. On the left side, between the 50 and 70 ohms mark, the small mark, the small marks represent 5 ohms each. To take accurate readings of unknown resistance values, it is recommended that the range selector switch be changed until the reading falls on the mid-third of the scale. An ohm meter comes with a, with a selection of ranges that can be changed by rotating the selector switch. Typical range values are R times 10, R times 100, R times 1K, R times 10K. These markings meant mean that the reading indicator on the ohms should be multiplied by 10, 100, 1000, or 10,000 respectively. Review questions for section 2.4. An ohmmeter is used to measure resistance. 2. An ohmmeter uses a nonlinear scale while a voltmeter uses a linear scale. 3. You must calibrate an ohmmeter before use. Yes. Why must you calibrate it? For accuracy, find the value of the multiplier resistor Rx in the following circuit. It should read 50 volts across A to B. Using Ohm's law, R equals voltage divided current, or Rm equals voltage divided current. If Rm equals 49 kilovolt, kilo ohms, If RA, RM equals 49.9 volts divided, we know the voltage, which is 49.9 volts, and we know the current for full deflection. If we know it should read 50 volts from point A to point B, which is the two ends of the circuit, we know for full deflection it only takes 0.1 volt to cause full deflection. So Rx should be 49.9 volts or 50, or 50 volts minus 0.1, which is 49.9 volts. So we know the voltage, which is 49.9 volts. And the voltage must be divided, divided by current. The current is is known to be 0.001 amp. So divide 49.9 volts by 0.001 amp, we get 49,900 ohms, which is the answer. The volt ohm meter, millimeter, or VOM, VOM. The common and simple multimeter used in the electronic circuits is the volt ohm meter, or VOM. A VOM is a voltmeter, ammeter, and the ohmmeter all in one. The VOM has the advantages of being inexpensive and portable. It does, however, usually have a low input resistance in ohms per volt on the lowest voltage range. This factor can cause accuracy problems. When an electronic device called a field effect transistor was developed, a VOM was designed to overcome the low input impedance problem. The field effect transistor, transistor or VOM, The field effect transistor bomb or FET bomb measures AC and DC voltages, the AC and DC current resistance and decibel ratings. Some multimeters are also equipped with accessories such as temperature probes. The leads of the temperature probe are inserted into the meter while the probe itself can be placed in front of an air conditioning duct near a furnace heater or submerged in hot liquid. The scale of the meter reflects the temperature in Celsius and or Fahrenheit. The optional accessories for bombs include adapters for reading higher than normal voltages and larger than normal meter current values. Digital multimeters. Digital multimeters or DMMs are the most commonly used meters in the electronic fields today. They are rapidly replacing the analog meter which operates on the principle of magnetism and 
and rotating coil discussed in the previous examples. The DMM <clears throat> uses the modern electronic circuitry to take electrical measurements and display values, usually in a liquid crystal display screen. This circuitry is beyond the scope of this chapter. See figure 2-16. Digital meters are more rugged and smaller in size than analog meters. They also are very accurate and very portable. However, some technicians still prefer the analog meters for taking certain types of readings involving solid state circuits. This will be explained in more depth when solid state electronic devices are explored. The liquid crystal display shows the meter reading in digits rather than on a scale. Some DMMs simultaneously display digits as well as a bar graph that simulates a linear scale reading. Figure 2-17, digital meters are not only Digital meters not only measure volts, ohms, and current, but also can test electronic components such as transistors and diodes. Figure 2-18, the, di the digital multimeter can come with a rotary dial, like the analog meter, to select functions or a keypad that is pressed with the fingertips. Most digital meters use an interna international standard of label labels to indicate vari various meter functions such as AC and DC, combination of symbols. Figure 2-19, the graphic symbols for AC and DC are often combined with metric prefixes to identify the function or range of the meter setting. Figure 2-17, this DMM display values in a numerical form or in a graphical form. Many digital multimeters are equipped with protective circuitry to prevent accidental damage when the wrong function is used to take the reading. Not all digital meters have this capability, but it is available. Polarity is usually not an issue when using a digital, a digital meter. The meter will be automatically adjusted for an incorrect polarity. It will flash a message or symbol on the liquid crystal display warning the user of the wrong polarity. Some digital meters have an auto range feature. This means that it is not necessary to determine the range to select when to select when using the meter. On these meters, this function is done automatically through the internal electronic circuitry. Figure 2-20 resistance reading using a, D a DMM still requires you to disconnect the circuit from the power source to prevent damaging the meter. Figure 2-18, the lower at the lower right of the selector switch of this DMM is a setting to test diodes and capacitors. Figure 2-19, the international graphic symbols for AC and DC combined with, combined with other electrical prefix symbols to indicate a meter setting. Computer display meters. Some manufacturers offer interface cards that can be installed on a personal computer and have test leads similar to, to meter leads. After the interface board is installed in an expansion slot in the computer, software is loaded. Now the computer will display simulated meters on the monitor. The computer can then be used to take voltage, current, and resistance readings. Using the computer is very similar to using a digital meter, but with the computer you can use the memory and hard drive system to store measurements and retrieve them later. This type of metering equipment is commonly installed in new industry applications to monitor high-speed assembly equipment or, te or to test electrical products. AC meter readings. When the AC when AC is applied to the meter movement, the needle does not deflect. 
Remember that AC rapidly changes direction. The meter coil current changes direction and pace with the applied AC voltage. The result is that the magnetic field rises and collapses and then reverses so rapidly that the coil cannot deflect the needle. The coil simply vibrates under the influence of applied AC voltage. To remedy this, a meter changes the AC voltage into DC by means of a rectifier. The rectifier is covered in detail in Chapter 17. For now, it is sufficient to say that a rectifier converts the applied AC current to AC current of equal value to a DC current of equal value. When the applied AC current is rectified to an equal DC value, the value is referred to as, a, as the RMS value. The abbreviation RMS stands for root mean square. This is a formula used to equate AC voltage to DC voltage. The RMS value is the equivalent DC value of an AC waveform. Many meter scales and some DMMs use this abbreviation. Some meters have a special location to plug in the meter lead when reading AC voltage or current. Many meters have a scale marking printed as RMS. This simply means that the readings taken on that scale are equal to are equal for DC or AC voltages. Resolution. Resolution is a term that describes the degree of change that must take place before the meter will display the value. For example, if a meter has a resolution of 1 to 1, 1 to 1,000, 1 to 1,000, it can measure voltage down to the millivolt, to 1 millivolt. In general, the better the meter, the resolution, the more expensive the meter. In digital meters, the resolution is also determined by how many digits, digits the meter can, can display. A digital meter with a five digit readout has a better resolution than a, di than a digital meter with a four digit readout. Important meter information. Multimeters are very useful tools. There are a number of important details to remember when using these meters. A meter is a delicate instrument. Handle it with care and respect. Jarring, dropping, and other rough treatment can damage a meter, especially coil meter movements. When measuring voltage, the meter must be connected in parallel to the device being read. Start on the highest range when measuring an unknown voltage and move slowly to a lower range for increased accuracy as needed. Remember to observe correct polarity. The red or positive lead goes to the positive side of the circuit. The black or negative lead goes to the negative side of the circuit. When measuring currents, an AND meter must be connected in series with the, seri with the circuit. A wire must be disconnected to insert the meter. It is wise to make a rough current calculation using Ohm's law to determine the proper current range on the meter. When troubleshooting a circuit, it is best to start on the highest possible setting. A faulty component can cause higher currents that could that would be normally that would not be normally expected. Again, observe correct polarity: red to the positive side of the circuit and black to the negative side of the circuit. When measuring resistance, be certain not to power, be certain that no power is applied to the circuit. It is best to disconnect the voltage source before taking any resistant measurements. In general, it is not necessary to observe polarity when taking resistance measurements. However, as you advance through your studies, polarity must be observed when checking certain solid state devices. Always adjust and zero the meter on proper range before measurements are made. The ohm meter should be readjusted after changing, changing ranges or after prolonged use. An open circuit will have an infinite reading. On all meter measurements, make a flash check before permanently connecting the meter to the circuit. What does a flash check mean? First, a decision should be made on how to connect the meter to the circuit. Then the only then only the negative lead 
should be connected with the positive meter left disconnected while observing the meter. Quickly touch and remove the positive lead to the circuit. Did the, the, did the needle move in the wrong direction? If so, polarity must be changed. Did the needle move too violently? If so, the meter range selector should be changed to a higher range. Remember, you should start on the highest range when you are not positive on the voltage or current values. The flash check will save you many dollars in meter replacement and repairs as well as wasted time. A meter has its greatest accuracy at two-thirds deflection of the meter scale. Use the range that reads as close to this deflection as possible. Often electronic circuits are quite compact. Be sure to test leads. Be sure that the test leads do not cross over or more two or more connection points, as this could result in a short circuit. Be sure that the test leads are in good working condition. There should be no frayed or bare wiring. Make it a habit to keep your fingers from touching any exposed metal part of the test lead, lead tips and or the circuits being tested. Most of the time you'll be working with voltages that are harmless, but sooner or later you'll be working with circuits that can produce severe or fatal sho shocks. The habits you develop while testing low voltage circuits will be carried with you when you're working with higher voltages. Make a habit of testing circuits safely on when danger voltages are present. Do not make the common mistake of connecting the meter to a voltage source without first changing the selector mode switch after checking resistance or, or amperage. In addition to some meters, in addition some meters have a separate input for the test leads when in the current mode, especially when high currents are to be measured. You may have selected the correct mode of operation using the selector switch but left the test lead plugged into the wrong meter jack. It is very important not to attempt reading from the back of a television picture tube or a computer monitor. There are extremely high voltages present in these locations and the meter usually requires special high voltage test leads specifically designed for this purpose. Caution. When using a multimeter or a DMM, it is easy to connect the meter to a voltage source immediately after taking resistance or current readings. This is the most common mistake when using a multimeter or DMM. This action will result in damage to the meter or personal injury. Electric shock. Almost all electrical systems contain a ground. A ground provides a safe path for an electrical fault and has a zero volt potential. It is typically constructed by connecting a conductor between, the, between one of the electrical system conductors and the earth. On AC systems, the neutral conductor is grounded. On DC systems, the negative conductor is grounded. Some electrical systems do not connect directly to the earth. Instead, the metal enclosures or metal conduits serve as a ground or as a return path to current for current. If a person touches an energized conductor, that person can easily serve as the path to ground. As shown in figure 2-21, an experienced, electric, an experienced electric shock. Also, if a system experiences an electrical fault, the metal enclosure or conduit may have a higher voltage potential than the earth ground. Thus, a person, touch, a person touching the enclosure or conductor can experience electric shock. Some devices are double insulated which means the outside enclosure is not grounded. A person using the device will not be in contact with the ground circuit by using the device and thus will most likely not experience electric shock should a ground fault occur. Figure 2-21, when a person touches an energized conductor, 
his or her body completes a circuit to ground. Electric shock levels. A person can experience different levels of electric shock. These are rated by value of current flow and the effect of each current value and the effect each current value has on the human body. The values of current flow and their effects are listed in the following table. Current, one milliamp, is barely noticeable. That's the effect. The current of five milliamps is the highest harmless value, but can be painful. From 10 to 20 milliamps, is, there can be sustained muscle con contraction the victim cannot let go. And from 100 to 300 milliamps, paralysis of respiratory muscles can be fatal. Severe internal, internal and external burns and can result in organ damage. Two amps could cause cardiac arrest and is and most times fatal. Lesson in safety. One of the best ways to avoid fatal electric shock is to keep one hand in your pocket while working with high voltages. This way any current flowing through your body does not flow through one hand and out the other. The amount of resistance through a person's body depends on many different things. For example, a resistance path from hand to foot will be higher than from hand to hand, especially if the person is wearing dry, dry shoes in good condition. Another factor is the amount of skin surface area connected to the potential. A person's skin condition is, most influential, is the most influential resistance factor. A person with dry skin has a high resistance of about 100,000 ohms. When the surface of the skin is covered with sweat, the resistance can be 10,000 ohms or less. Using Ohm's law and the table above, you can easily see how a person working with a 120 volt system in a hot enclosed area is susceptible to sustained muscle contraction should electric shock occur. To prove this, using Ohm's law, 120 volts divided 10,000 ohms equals 12 milliamps. The National Electric Code or NEC requires all electrical systems of 50 volts or higher to be grounded. This rule is to protect people from electrocution when they come into contact with components in an electrical system. A properly grounded electrical device will, will produce a low resistance path for current. When the properly grounded device comes into contact with an energized conductor, the, fused or, the fuse or breaker will automatically trip or open the circuit. Ground Fault Interrupter A ground fault interrupter, or GFI, provides protection from excessive fault currents through the human body. The NEC requires ground fault protection for specific locations where there is a high probability of electric shock, such as damp, wet locations. A ground fault interrupter provides protection by monitoring and comparing the current through the hot and neutral conductors. A complete circuit has the same current in the hot and neutral conductors. <clears throat> if a ground fault occurs, part of the current will flow through the ground will, will flow to ground. When part of the current flows to ground, the comparator circuit detects an unbalanced condition between the hot and the neutral currents. If the difference between the hot and the neutral conductor exceeds five milliamps, the, comp the comparator circuit will energize the trip coil and cause a contact to open in the hot condu conductor circuit, circuit. This stops the flow of current through, the, through both 
the outlet and the person holding a device that is plugged into the outlet. The electric shock is stopped almost in instantaneously. After the GFI is stripped, the red reset button needs to be pressed to reset the GFI trip mechanism once more. The figure, see figure 2-22, be aware of a condition known as the nuisance, nuisance trip, which occurs when there is excessive moisture in the device area. Ground fault protection devices are not limited to power outlet designs. They are commonly incorporated in GFI style circuit breakers. Non-GFI power outlets can be used with single GFI type breakers. The non-GFI power outlet will then provide the same protection as a GFI outlet provides. This is a very cost-effective solution when several outlets are required to be GFI type. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation (CPR). When working with electrical systems, there are always there is always a real, real danger of electrocution. The heart may stop beating because of the electric shock. Cardiopulmonary cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR is an emergency technique consisting of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and a series of chest compressions. The basics of CPR will be covered in this section, but you should take a CPR course from a certified instructor to be com competent to administer CPR. In case of an accident, call for her call call for help. Check to see if live wires are still in contact with the victim and move any away with a non-conductive item. Check to see if the victim is responsive. If the victim is responsive, he or she most likely doesn't need CPR. However, if the victim is not responsive and not breathing, and not breathing, you will need to administer CPR until help arrives. To administer CPR, you will need to ensure the airway is clear with the victim lying on, on his or her back, tilt the head back and lift the chin. Place your mouth over the victim's, over the victim's mouth and give two short breaths. Position your hands in the center of the victim's chest and firmly press down rapidly 30 times. Continue with two breaths followed by 30 pumps until help arrives. Review questions for section 2.5. What does abbreviation, the abbreviation COM stand for? On a meter and what it is, what is its polarity? It stands for common and the polarity is negative. What does DM stand for, or DMM, digital multimeter? What does resolution mean when, refer when referring to a DMM? The accuracy of the measurement as displayed in the LCD. How do you connect an ammeter to a circuit in series by first opening the circuit? How do you connect a voltmeter to a circuit in parallel with the load? Which of the three meters should not be used while the circuit is energized, the ohm meter. Two point six electrical diagrams. Electrical diagrams convey specific information to the technician. They illustrate such items as the size, type, component, part number, and component location in relationship to the other circuit components. Diagrams can be used for installation, fabrication, troubleshooting, or to explain the circuit's operation or purpose. Symbols are used to represent circuit components. Wires or conductors are usually shown as lines. Their connections can be shown a number of ways. See figure, see figure 2-23. One primary type of electrical drawing you will encounter is the schematic diagram. See figure 
This is a typical schematic diagram. It is shown, it shows what parts are needed and how they connect to one another. The distance between the components do not represent the actual distances. The main purpose of the schematic is to show how the components relate to each other. The diagram show which component are in series and or parallel with each other. Schematics are extremely valuable troubleshooting tools. Figure 2-23, schematics of wires. Two wires can cross on a schematic and not be electrically connected. The dot must be shown at the intersection for a connection to be made. Figure 2-24, a typical schematic illustrates the, the location of the components and how they relate to one another. The combination of meters, wiring diagrams, schematics, and electronic theory allow a technician to find circuit to find circuit problems. Many circuits are impossible to troubleshoot without the aid of schematics and the application of electronic theory. In Figure 2-25 is a comparison of an elementary line diagram and a wiring diagram. This illustration shows the operation of a typical stop-start motor control system. The elementary line di diagram on the left is similar to this to a schematic. It is used primarily in industrial processes to illustrate how a system's electrical controls relate to each other. On the right is the actual is the actual wiring diagram. This would be used to connect the control system. The elementary diagram clearly illustrates how the circuit operates while the wiring while the wiring diagram illustrates the relative positions of the connection points and the components as they would actually be found in the equipment each diagram has its own purpose sometimes a block diagram is used to show how an, an, an overall system works look at figure 2-26 to see a block diagram of a typical AM radio The components, such as the amplifier, are grouped together in stages. Figure 2-27 is a typical plan of the electrical circuits to be installed in one room of a, res of a residence. Figure 2-25, both the elementary line diagram and the wiring diagram shown here are of the same electrical system, but they are presented in two different ways. The elementary line diagram is used to clearly express how the circuit works. The wiring diagram is used to install the system. In figure 2-26, a block diagram is used to illustrate how major electrical systems relate to each other. Figure 2-27, typical layout of a residential room to be wired by an electrician. All information necessary to correctly wire the room is indicated on the plan or print. Drawing indicates the general location of switches, outlets, and lighting. Descriptions of wire sizes, switch amperages, and breaker sizes are not shown on this type of plan because the electrician is trained to be familiar with the electrical codes dealing with these factors. As you progress through the text, you will gain a large symbol vocabulary. This will help you inter interpret many different types of electrical drawings. This vocabulary combined with a complete understanding of schematics and meters will help you troubleshoot repair and construct any electrical systems rapidly when constructing an electrical system you may find using a circuit design software program beneficial circuit designers rely heavily on computers and software for modern electronic circuit design see figure 2-28 in these software programs components can be selected from menus and placed on the drawing area. Electronic characteristics, 
for each component, such as resistance, values, current ratings, and voltage limits, can also be added. Software systems not only can be used to draw out electronic circuitry, they can actually be used to simulate the circuit as though it was constructed with electronic components. Virtual meters can be connected to the points in the circuit experimentation and, and testing. A complete list of materials can be generated from the circuit design. The pattern required for a printed circuit board can be printed. This makes the design and testing process quicker and easier than if the circuit was built using actual components. Once the circuit design is tested, to satisfaction the circuit can be built using the actual components. Review questions for section 2.6. What is a schematic? It is a drawing that can show an electrical circuit for building, operation, or troubleshooting. What are the symbols used for? Name three typical electrical drawings and the use of each. A block diagram shows flow, how the system operates overall. The elementary wi wiring draw drawing clearly expresses how the system works. And the wiring diagram is an aid to install or troubleshoot the system. Analog meters, summary, analog meters use a scale with continuous variable values. Digital meters give values in discrete amounts in units 0 through 9. The basic meter movement used for many analog instruments is the moving coil galvanometer or the 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 the, the, the Arsenval, Arsenval movement. Three, it is vital to observe correct polarity in the use of analog meters. Four, linear meter scales have evenly spaced marks. And meters and voltmeters use linear scales. Nonlinear scales do not have evenly spaced marks. Ohm meters use nonlinear scale. And meters measure current and are connected in series in a circuit. Shunts are resistors connected in parallel with and meters to increase the range of the meter. Voltmeters measure voltage and are connected in parallel with the component to be read. The, multipl the multiply resistor is connected in series with voltmeters to increase the range of the meter. The sensitivity of a meter is an indication of its quality. Sensitivity is measured in ohms per volt ratings. Another system of rating accuracy is based on percentage of full-scale reading. When a voltmeter is connected across a circuit to measure potential difference, it is in parallel with the load in the circuit. This situation can introduce errors in voltage measurement. A meter used to measure the value of an unknown resistance is called an ohmmeter. Ohmmeters are connected across the resistance being measured. A multimeter is one instrument that will measure a number of different types of values, such as current, voltage, and resistance. Digital meters are rugged, small in size, accurate, and portable. There are a number of different types of electrical diagrams. They include schematics, wiring diagrams, line diagrams, and block diagrams.
This is a reading of chapter 3, Electricity and Electronics. The chapter is titled, Introduction to Basic Electrical Circuit Materials. All electricity and electronics is based on the fundamental concept of moving electrons through some type of material and then applying electrons to a load. At the load, the electrical energy is transformed into another form of energy, such as heat, light, magnetism. In this chapter, we shall explore methods to control the flow of electrons using common devices and materials. In addition, we will explore the conversion of electrical energy for some uses, such as lighting. Conductors. Conductors are the pathway that allow electrons to flow through an electrical circuit. Conductors can be made of various shapes and sizes. They can be made from a number of different materials. The most common conductor you will encounter is copper wiring. Copper is an excellent conductor and can be formed into many different shapes. Copper comes in round, square, stranded, solid, flat ribbon, and bar shaped shapes. Each shape has its own unique quality qualities that make it best for use in some specific application. Conductors vary depending on the type of material from which they are made. Copper is an excellent conductor. Silver is an even better conductor. However, silver is too expensive to be used in common circuits. Many high voltage lines are made from aluminum because it is lightweight. And they have a center core made of stranded steel for added strength. Brass is used for electrical mechanical equipment such as switch parts because of its strength and conductive properties. The actual conduction of electricity is done by transferring electrons from one atom to the next atom in the conductor. Assume that a piece of copper wire is neutral. If an electron is forced into one, of, one, of, one end of the wire, then an electron will also be forced out of the other end. The original electron did not flow through the conductor, yet the energy was transferred by the interaction between the electrons in the conductor. The actual transfer of electrical energy occurs at an amazing speed. The speed has been accurately measured and it approaches the speed of light or 186 miles per second. In metric terms, it is 300,000 kilometers per second. The unit for measuring the conductance is the Siemens. This unit was, met, was named after the German inventor Ernst von Siemens, who did a great deal of work in the development of telegraphy use. The abbreviation for the Siemens is the capital S. The unit formula for computing electrical conductance is as follows. G equals 1 over R, where G is conductance in Siemens and R is its resistance in ohms. The, conduct, the conductance of a material is the reciprocal of the resistance of the material. Lesson in safety. Your body is a good conductor of electricity. Never touch a circuit conductor or component unless you are sure that it is, it is not energized. An electric current flow, an electric current flowing in one hand across your chest and heart and out the other hand is dangerous and can be fatal. The smart technician uses only one hand when working on high voltage circuits or live voltage circuits. The other hand is kept in a pocket. Technicians who work on high voltage lines work in insulated bucket trucks or on insulated platforms. Standing on a rubber mat while working on electrical systems is a standard safety and a wise practice. While the technician is standing on an insulated material, there is no direct path to ground in case of an accidental contact to conduct with a conductor. Conductor sizes. Conductors are sized by the cross-sectional area. The amount of cross-sectional area of a conductor has, de has been determined The amount of cross-sectional area a conductor has determines how much current it can handle without overheating. Circular conductors are arranged according to size by the American wire gauge system. 
or AWG. The larger the gauge, the number, the, the, lar the larger the gauge number, the smaller the cross-sectional area a wire will have. For example, a number 14 wire is larger than a number 20, say figure 3-2. This system of this system of wire sizes was developed over 100 years ago. At that time, no one could foresee that the demand for electrical products would make this system obsolete. Some wire sizes are now, are now larger, larger than number one conductor. A temporary solution to this problem created the next set of larger sizes. The next four sizes were developed are zero, pronounced oct, double oct, triple oct, and quadruple oct, or one through four oct. or 1 arc, 2 arc, 3 arc, 4 arc, etc. When it came apparent that even larger sizes would be needed, the final solution for the sizing problem, a third set of sizes was developed. The final system of sizing is the circular mill system. The circular mill system is based on a diameter of the conductor measured in mils, or 1 1,000th one one thousand of an inch. Typical conductors larger than 4 arc are from 250 kilo centimeters to 2,000 kilo centimeters. Excuse me, 250 kilo cmils or KCMs to 2,000 kilo cmils or 2,000 KCMs. The letter KCM represents 1,000 circular mils. So a 250 KCM represents 250,000 circular mils. Figure 3-3 three, three three contains all the wire sizes you would normally encounter. Circular mils. Circular mils. Circular mill area is the common way to express the cross-sectional area of a conductor. As previously noted, one mil is equal to one one thousandth of an inch or 0 0.001 inches. The number, of the number of circular mills or C mill is a conductor in a conductor is equal to the diameter of a round conductor squared or D to the D squared or D is in mills. Therefore, a wire with the, with the diameter of one mill has an area of one circular mill or one C mill. A wire with a diameter of two mills has an area of four C mils, or two times two, which equals four. A wire with, with a diameter of 15 mils gives us an area of 225 C mil, or 15 times 15, which equals 225. See figure 3-4. The circular mill is a more convenient method of expressing the size of a conductor than pi squared, pi r squared, which is used to compute the area of a circle. We must find the area of a square or a rectangular conductor. If we must find the area of a square or, or a rectangular conductor, their equivalent in C mills is not difficult to find. To find the circular mills equivalent compute the square rectangular conductor's area in square mills and then divide that area by 0 0.7854. For example, if a one inch by a quarter inch bar of copper is to be used as a conductor, first convert the inch measurements to mils. One inch equals 100, excuse me, 1,000 mils, and a quarter inch equals 250 mils. Then multiply the dimensions in mils to get the area in square mils. 1,000 times 250, 150,000 square mils. Finally, divide the square mil area, 0.78. By 4 by 0.7854, which equals 318, 309,000. Excuse me, 318,309. This results in the original one inch by one quarter copper bar having a surface area equivalent to a round conductor of 318,309 C mils. 
Wire charts commonly express the electrical values for conductors solely based on their size in C mills to determine the current carrying capacity of resistance or resistance value of a rectangular conductor of a rectangular conductor. A rectangular conductor must be converted to circular mills. Wire charts are commonly wire charts commonly express the electrical values for conductors solely based on their size in C mills to determine the current carrying capacity or resistance value of a rectangular conductor. The rectangular conductor must be converted to C mills. Conductor insulation. Materials with only a few free electrons do not conduct electrons well. These materials are called insulators. To keep the electron flow contained to the conductor path and to prevent contact with other conductors people and people, conductors are coated. This protective coating is called insulation. As the name implies, insulation is made of insulating materials such as rubber, plastic, and other synthetic materials. There are many types of insulation commonly known today. These materials include thermoplastic, neoprene, teflon, nylon, and polyethylene. The type, of conduct, the type of conductor insulation is determined by the application of the electrical system. In determining insulation type, many factors must be taken into consideration. Some questions you might, one might ask would include, will the insulation be exposed to extreme heat generated by an industrial furnace or the extreme cold of a freezer in a food processing plant? Will the insulation need to withstand exposure to acidic vapors in a chemical plant or wet acidic soil? Will the cable be exposed to oil from manufacturing equipment? Will the insulation give off toxic fumes if burnt? Will the insulation in a building affect the breathable air to its occupants? Ins Insulation coatings. Insulations are marked with cold letters indicating their approved uses. Examples of these markings are HH for high heat resistant, M for oil resistant, UF for underground installation, etc. When selecting conductor insulation, all conditions must be considered. A brief list follows R for rubber, H for heat, HH for high heat, A for asbestos, T for thermoplastic, M for oil resistant, UF for underground feeder and C for corrosion resistant. Conductor insulation may be color coded to assist ignition in a building throughout some other electrical applications such as an auto automobile. At times the colors represent certain volume, certain voltages, polarities, or grounding conductors. The color used is generally governed, governed by the building codes or manufacturing associations. Uniform standards in the color coding of insulators assist the technician in troubleshooting electrical and electronic systems. Types of conductors. Conductor, conductor wiring comes in many shapes and assemblies. See figure 3-5. The conductor can be solid or stranded. There can be one or more conductors inside one cable assembly. The insulation jacket sometimes contains a metallic sheath to provide added protection against physical damage or to prevent interference from other electrical systems. The conductor assembly can be flat to accommodate special installations, or it can be designed to be installed in electrical pipe, referred to as conduit. Conductors have many applications that require a unique design to match the type of special electronic application. Some of these applications are telephone communication cables, cable television, computer lines, high voltage transmission cable, fiber optics, motor and relay windings, and marine applications. There are hundreds of types of conductors available today. Conductor resistance. Even though conductors provide a low resistance path for electron flow, 
they still have some resistance. This resistance must be considered when long distances are involved. There are four factors directly relating to the resistance of conductors. Cross-sectional area of the conductor. The larger the surface area or diameter of a conductor, the lower the resistance. The type of conductor material. Different materials have different resistance values. Length of the conductor. The longer the conductor, the greater the resistance. Temperature of material. Resistance of a material rises with rise in temperature. Cross-sectional area of a conductor. Increasing the cross-sectional area of a conductor increases the amount of current that can flow. To help visualize this, use the flow of water through a pipe as an example. Figure 3-6. A large diameter pipe can carry more gallons of water per minute than a small diameter pipe. An electric conductor operates in the same fashion. The larger diameter the conductor carries, more electrons per minute than a small diameter conductor. Types of material. As discussed in chapter one, some materials are better conductors than others. The type of material affects conductance and resistance. Figure 3-7 shows, shows one example as number 12 copper wire has 1.619 ohms resistance per 1,000 feet. An aluminum conductor of the same diameter and length offers 2.57 ohms of resistance. Length of conductor. The length of a conductor greatly affects its total resistance. If one foot of wire has a certain resistance, then 10 feet has the same of the same wire will have 10 times the resistance. 50 feet of the wire will have a 50 times more resistance and so on. As a conductor becomes longer, it creates a voltage drop in a circuit. A circuit using short lengths of wire, such, in, such as an electrical lab project using three to six inches of number, two wa number 22 wire does not create a major problem, but long runs of wiring can create electrical problems. In figure 3-8, a 10 amp, 10 amp load is connected to a circuit using number 22 copper wire. The load is at a distance of 100 feet from the source. When the switch to the motor is closed to connect the motor, the motor will heat up internally because an insufficient voltage is being applied. The low voltage is a result of the voltage drop Along the, length, along the length of the conductor. The loss of voltage can be co computed using Ohm's law. Figure 3-8, the voltage drop caused by the resistance of 200 feet of number 22 copper conductor wire connected to a 10 amp load is to 32.9 volts or 16.5 volts for each 100 feet of conductor. The electrons must travel at a total distance of 200 feet to make a complete circuit. The total resistance of the wiring is equal to 3.29 ohms. The current through the load is 10 amps. By applying Ohm's law these, to these conditions, a voltage drop equal to 32.9 volts has been created. E equals 10, e equals 10 amps times 3.9 ohms. Subtracting the 32.9 volt drop from the available source voltage of 120 volts leaves only 87.1 volts for the load. This amount of voltage is undesirable and will, not and will no doubt cause equipment failure, especially for an electrical motor load such as a drill. A lesson in safety. When using long extension cords to operate light, lights and tools, be sure that they have sufficient conductor size. The larger the wire size used, the smaller the voltage drop created. Small diameter extension cords conductors may heat up and burn. Motor driven tools at the end of a long extension cord can heat up and operate insufficient, inefficiently.
Temperature of a material. A fourth consideration in conductivity is temperature. Most materials, most metals used in conductors such as copper and aluminum increase in resistance as the ambient temperature rises. Ambient temperature is the temperature of the material surrounding the conductor, such as air, water, or soil. In many electronic products, careful design is necessary to ensure proper ventilation and radiation of heat from the current carrying conductors. Many electrical products, such as computers, have a fan installed inside the appliance to circulate, circulate heat away from electronic components. These components can be damaged by heat easily. When many conductive materials are, are exposed to extremely low temperatures, their resistance value approaches zero. These materials become superconductors. Figure 3-9 is a picture of a superconducting cable. Magnets can be produced from these superconductors. Early experiments with supermagnets using superconductors produced magnetic fields so powerful that the magnetic housing was crushed by the tremendous force. Since electrical motors operate on the principles of magnetism, the more powerful the magnet, the more powerful the electric motor will be. Superconductive material is also used in some magnetic imaging medical equipment. The superconductive materials have made it possible to peer deep into the human body. Magnetism and electromagnetism will be explained in detail in chapter 9. To make a superconductor, the temperature of the conductive material must be lowered to nearly absolute zero, negative 273 degrees Celsius or negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. Liquid nitrogen is used to cool the conductive materials to such a low temperature. Today, some materials display superconductive superconductive properties at much higher temperatures. In 1987, a team of scientists produced a superconductor at, at approximately 270 degrees Fahrenheit. New applications for superconductors are appearing everywhere. Safety organizations and standards. There are many different organizations that work together to protect the worker and the general public from dangerous conditions and hazards, such as those caused by improper wiring. These organizations create and use safety standards such which may be which may then be adopted by government agencies. The National Fire Protection Agency. The National Fire Protection Agency or NFPA is an organization dedicated to fire protection. The NFPA provides information about how fires are started and specific fire prevention methods. NFPA provides many publications dealing with topics of how to handle volatile chemicals and flammable materials. The NFPA produces the National Electric Code, NEC, which is a special publication that relates directly to your course of study of electricity and electronics. National Electrical Code. The NEC or National Electrical Code is a set of electrical standards that should be followed to ensure the safety of people and property. The set of standards was developed by NFPA and contains over 700 pages describing how electrical equipment and systems should be installed. This is the main guide used for all electrical construction in the United States. Government agencies in city, county, state, and federal, level, at federal, and federal levels often adopt the, the code in its entirety, entirety and may rewrite some of the code to meet higher standards. The set of standards define how electrical work should be accomplished and lists the minimal specifications for materials being used. Underwriters Laboratories Inc. Underwriters Laboratories Inc. is an independent, non for profit organization that conducts tests for the interest of public the public safety. If UL tests equipment and finds that it is that it 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 satisfies minimal safety standards, the equipment is awarded their seal of approval. The UL seal is of approval shown in figure 3-10 is a recognized industry standard that, provide, that proves the product has been independently tested and approved as a safe product. It also ensures the products being produced will continually meet minimal safety standard standards. There are over 20 billion UL seals on 19,000 different types of products. Occupational Safety and Health Administration. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, is part of the U.S. Department of Labor and is mainly responsible for worker safety. OSHA conducts on safety inspections on, of industries that have reportedly high incident, incidents of accidents. 
OSHA has the authority to inspect and fine industries that do not meet minimal safety standards. For example, OSHA can inspect a facility to ensure all workers are using UL approved non-conductive step ladders for electrical work or ensure worker areas have proper ventilation to remove any hazardous fumes. Be aware that OSHA has adopted the NEC standards. OSHA is not limited to electrical work, but it is responsible for the safety of all industries, such as agriculture, automobile, fishing, manufacturing, and warehouse operations. Conductor voltage drop. The National Electric Code, NEC, has set maximum voltage drop standard for branch circuits. A branch circuit is the wiring from an electrical circuit panel to the last device connected to that circuit. A maximum of 3% volt, voltage drop is permissible by NEC standards. A formula for calculating the size conductor needed to stay within, within the 3% limit is below. CMA equals K times I times L over VD, where CMA is the area of cir in circular mills, K is the material constant, I is the amperage, and L is the length of wire, and VD is the voltage drop. Example, first decide the type of material to be used in wiring the circuit, copper or aluminum. The material constant, K for copper is 12. The material constant for aluminum is 18. This is an NEC standard based on the resistance of the material. To find the size of the copper conductor needed for a 10 amp load loaded at 150 feet, located 150 feet from the circuit breaker panel, we must multiply the material constant times the amperage times the length, K times I times L. Remember, the length is twice the distance from the panel. Next, divide, the, divide by the permissible 3% voltage drop. The voltage in this case is 120 volts. 3% of 120 volts is 3.6 volts. CMA, just naming the formula here, CMA equals to 12 times 10 times 300 all over 3.6, which equals CMA of 36,000 over or divided by 3.6, which equals to CMA equals to 10,000 10, or a number 10 copper conductor is needed. This formula is very handy when trying to determine a conductor size that will not cause significant voltage drop. Excessive voltage drops prevent electrical equipment from operating properly. Review questions for section 3.1. One, a half inch is equal to 500 mils. Two, a cross sectional area of a conductor is measured in C mils or circular mils. The unit measure for conductance is the Siemens. What is the circular mill area of a number two, number 22 copper wire? According to the chart on page 55, it equals to number 22 copper wire equals to 1022. circular mills. Excuse me, that is not equal, that is not per that uh, table. Calculations will be needed. Five, list four factors that affect conductor resistance. One, cross-sectional area. Two, temperature. Three, length. And four, material. What is the resistance value of 500 feet of number four copper conductor? The formula is ohms or resistance of 0.2533 ohms divided 1 k feet or 1 kilo feet 1000 feet which equals to 0.12665 divided 0.5 uh, thousand feet
Section 3.2 Special Conductor Pathways There are several special conductor pathways used in electrical and electronic work. They are the breadboard, printed circuit board, and the metal chassis. These pathways serve special needs, yet their main purpose is the same as any other conductor to provide a good conductive path for electron flow. Breadboards A breadboard is a useful device for learning about circuits. A breadboard consists of a series of holes aligned in rows across the entire surface of an insulation material, such as plastic. Copper strips are run in parallel under the rows of holes and are used as conductor pathways. Electronic devices such as resistors and transistors are inserted in the, into the holes. Jumper wires are then used to make additional connections between the devices. The breadboard provides an easy way an easy system for constructing circuit, circuits quickly. The boards are commonly used in experiments or to make a prototype of a circuit before the circuit is sol soldered or constructed in a mass assembly systems. Some boards are called proto boards, say figure 3-11. Printed circuit boards, PCBs, are made from a thin layer of conductor material, usually copper foil, cut into strips and attached to an insulated board. The strips act as the circuits as the circuit paths. Components are inserted through holes in the insulated board and then sol soldered to the conductive strips at circular spots called connection pads. The connection pads provide the extra area required for making good solar solder connections. Figure 3-12 shows a typical circuit board layout. A heat sink area is a wide copper surface that is used for a common connection point for many devices as well as to dissipate heat, the heat generated by the electronic devices. Edge connectors provide the electrical point for attachment to other electrical equipment. The conductor, the, the conductor paths can be less than 0 0.001 inch in thickness. These strips can be one side or both sides depending on the design of the board. The currents used on most boards are very low and usually do not require heavy wiring. Construction of printed circuit boards. A printed circuit board starts out with a thin sheet of copper foil covering the entire surface of an insulating material. If the PCV is to be double-sided. Double Both sides will be covered with a thin sheet of foil. There are a couple of common methods used to produce the circuit design on the foil. The layout of the circuit can be put into on the cover using a resist, resist material. The board is then dipped into an enchant etchant. The etchant removes all of the copper surface not protected by the resist material. The board is then cleaned to remove any excess resist, of, resist or etchant. Holes are then drilled at the connection pads. Printed circuit boards can also be made using a photographic process. Like sensitive material covers, the surface of the board, a negative of the circuit board, is, the board layout is placed over the board. The board is then exposed to light and developed in a manner similar to that used in photography. After developing the unexposed area, areas are washed away with a solvent. The exposed area, the pattern of the circuit remains. The board is then etched as was described in the first method. Circuit board components can be installed by hand or by automated systems. The choice is usually based on economics. If a low number of boards are to be produced, and assembly is less costly if thousands of boards are to be produced and assembled automated systems are used. Chassis. In the early years of electronics components were mounted on metallic surfaces called chassis. The chassis itself served as a part of the circuitry. The use of a chassis as a conductor is not, a common, is not as common today but it is still in great use. One of the most visible uses of the chassis as a conductor is the automobile. The metal frame and body parts serve as a chassis providing a conductor path for the negative side ground of the circuit. 
positive lines leave the positive battery terminal and connects to the device, such as the car's headlamps. A fuse or circuit breaker is in series with the lamps for protection. A switch is also in series for turning the lamps on and off. The return to the negative of the battery is through the frame of the chat or the car of the car or the chassis itself. The negative conductor for, for the lamp simply terminates at the lamp location, connecting the metallic shell of the car. Connecting to the metallic shell of the car. The electrons return to the battery through the metallic frame of the car. Review questions for section 3.2. A temporary circuit is usually wired using a breadboard. The most economical way to mass produce an electronic circuit is using automated machines. The automobile is an example of a chassis wiring. Connection of devices to a PVC is usually made by etched connectors. What other type of transportation could use the frame for parts of an electrical circuit is the aircraft. 3.3 Common Circuit Devices There are several common circuit devices that are present in most electrical and electronic circuits. They provide a means of controlling electron flow through the conductor paths to provide for safe operation of circuits. The three important items discussed here are switches, connectors, and circuit protection devices. Switches. Switches are installed in circuits to control the flow of electrons through the circuit. They can be categorized by, the actu by their actuator and electrical switching path. The actuator is the mechanical device that causes the circuit to open and close. Various types of switches are illustrated in figure 3.14. The schematic symbol associated with each type of switch is also included. Some of the most common actuators are the slide, toggle, rotary, and push button. As you can see, the name of the switch indicates the type of actuator used to turn the switch on and off. The electrical circuit inside the switch is described in terms of poles and throws. The simplest type of switch is the single pole single throw switch, which is abbreviated as SPST. The term single pole means that the switch provides one path for the electron flow and that it can be turned off and on. The term single throw means that the switch controls only one circuit. Single pole double throw switch, SPDT, has one common connection point and can complete a circuit path to two different circuits. However, only one circuit, circuit can be completed at a time. There are several, there are many possibilities and combinations for a switch of this type. A useful application of the single pole double throw switch is its ability to control a load, such as a lamp, from two different locations. In residential wiring systems, the single pole double throw switch is referred to as a three-way switch. In figure 3-15, two single pole double throw switches are connected to a lamp. Either switch is capable of turning the lamp off and on. A double, a double pole double throw switch has two common connection points and can provide two switch paths simultaneously. The double pole double pole, double throw switch is like having two single pole single throw switches connected in parallel. Switch ratings. Switches are rated for impacity and voltage. The impacity rating of a switch is an indication of how much current it can safely handle. The voltage rating is the maximum voltage for which the switch is designed. Exceeding the maximum voltage rating will cause the electrical mechanical circuitry inside the switch to fail. For example, a toggle switch is rated at 1 amp and 24 volts. A current in excess of 1 amp will burn out the switch and circuitry inside of the switch. 
if the 24 volt switch <clears throat> is connected to a 240 volt circuitry it may fail to open the circuits sufficiently to stop the flow of electrons this action this action will, resu will result in a dangerous situation that can melt the switches insulation and short circuit the switch <coughs> connectors there are many types of connectors used with electrical conductors the type of connection used varies according to the type and size of the conductor the purpose served by the connection and the type of device to be connected look at figure 3-16 you will see many common types of connectors one general classification of solder solderless connectors a solderless connector <clears throat> does not require the use of solder to make a connection these connection connectors generally require a crimping tool the crimping tool squeezes the connector to the conductor figure 3-16 shows the common wire crimp on terminals and splices some types of connectors use screws and bolts in the form of mechanical connection to conductors these connectors are used primarily for larger conductors see figure 3-17 circuit protection devices Common circuit protection devices are fuses and circuit breakers. Fuses, such as those shown in figure 3-18, are constructed from small, fine wire. This wire is engineered to burn in certain amperages if certain amperages are exceeded. Fuses are sized by their voltage and current capacity, primarily currents. For example, a 3 amp fuse is designed to burn and open the circuit when the current exceeds 3 amps. A load that draws 3 amps or greater will generate sufficient heat in the fuse to melt the fuse link inside of the glass tube. The time required to melt the fuse link is inversely proportional to the amount of the overload. This means that the higher of the overload currents, the faster the melting action occurs. When the fuse melts, it must be replaced. A circuit breaker. A circuit breaker, sometimes called a reset, is another device used to protect a circuit from overload and short circuit conditions. See figure 3-19. The main advantage of a circuit breaker over the fuse link is that the circuit breaker need not be replaced after tripping. It can be reset by moving the handle to the off position and then returning to the on position. Some circuit breakers have an actuator similar to the push button switch. These breakers are pushed in to reset after, after tripping. Circuit breakers are, and resets require a waiting period to allow the internal trip mechanism to cool down. Most homes today use circuit, circuit breakers as a safety device to prevent overloads, and overloads could result in house fires. Circuit breakers are produced with two different tripping methods. One method is to buy metallic met, is, uses bimetallic strips. A bimetallic strip is a metal strip made of two different types of metal. Different metals expand at different rates. Heat generated from the overload condition causes the bimetal, bimetal trip to expand. The different metals expand at different rates. This causes the breaker's trip mechanism to bend and break contact. Some trip mechanisms are adjustable to allow a more precise trip current. A second tripping, a second tripping mechanism uses magnetism to operate. The circuit current runs through a coil. As the current increases through the coil, the amount of magnetism in the coil increases. When a predetermined point is reached, the tripping mechanism operates and opens the circuit. The magnetic circuit breaker is much faster and more accurate than the bimetallic circuit breaker. The magnetic circuit breaker, however, is more expensive than the bimetallic type. Lighting. There are many different methods in which light is produced. Light is generated when burning a variety of gases, methane, propane, liquids like gasoline, fuel, oil, and solids like wood or paper. Certain chemicals will luminescence when mixed together. 
Necklaces and bracelets filled with these chemicals are often sold at nighttime celebrations. Various min minerals and glow in the dark toys supply light through phos phospho phosphorescence. They absorb energy from sunlight or a lamp and then release this energy in the form of light when the energy source is removed. However, for most of our lighting systems, energy, the energy source is electricity. There are two very different types of electric lighting systems. One is incandescent lamp and the other is the discharge lamp. The incandescent lamp principles. In 1879, Thomas Edison developed the first successful incandescent lamp. In an incandescent lamp, and heat, light and heat are created from current flowing through a filament. The first lamp was of simple construction with a carbon filament inside a glass envelope to prevent the carbon from igniting. Soon afterward, the tungsten filament replaced the carbon filament. The tungsten filament proved to be a much more efficient method for producing light than carbon filament. In figure 3-20, the basic construction of the incandescent lamp is illustrated. Halogen lamp. In a halogen lamp, a tungsten filament is inserted through a glass tube and the tube is filled with halogen gas. This type of lamp will economically produce a great deal, deal of light. It is commonly used in automobile headlights. The halogen gas makes the tungsten filament last longer. The tungsten filament in most lamps evaporates over a long period of time due to the tremendous heat generated by tungsten filament lamps. The halogen re returns the boiled tungsten filament particles back to the filament, thus causing the filaments to last longer. See figure 3-21. A discharge lamp operates differently from an incandescent lamp. A ditch discharge lamp produces light by energizing a gas such as argon, neon, helium, or vapor of mercury or sodium. The gas or vapor is ionized by the electrical pressure and will glow, thus emitting light. A discharge lamp can easily produce 20 times more light than a conventional, than a conventional filament bulb while using the same type of the same type and amount of electrical energy. Descriptions of several types of discharge lamps follow. The fluorescent lamp. The fluorescent lamp consists of a long, la long glass tube coated on the inside with phosphor. See figure 3-22. A filament or electrode is inserted at each of the tube. At each end of the tube, the air is removed from the tube, and then it is filled with an inert gas and a small amount of mercury. When the tube is energized, the, filament, the filaments at the end will glow. However, the filaments do not provide very much light. The filaments are used to produce heat, which vaporizes the mercury inside of the tube. Once the mercury has been vaporized, the electrons flow along the mercury vapor. Ultraviolet light is produced inside of the tube. The ultraviolet light strikes the phosphor coating and makes and causes it to glow. This produces the familiar phosphorus light. A ballast is used to limit the current inside of the tube. The ballast consists of many turns of fine wire. The ballast is also used to produce a higher than usual voltage, which is applied to the filaments in the ends of the tube. An older style fluorescent lighting used starters in, this, in their circuitry between the ballast and the lamp. The purpose of the starter was to allow the filament inside of the lamp to conduct and produce the necessary heat to vaporize the mercury. Once this was accomplished, the starter would open and seize the heating action of the filament. Newer fluorescent lamps incorporate the device, a device in the end of the tube that replaces the need for a starter. Compact fluorescent lamp. 
Compact fluorescent lamps or CFLs are special fluorescent lamps designed to screw into a standard incandescent lamp. CFLs are much more efficient than incandescent lamps. For example, a traditional incandescent 60 watt lamp can be replaced with a 11 or 15 watt CFL and produce the same amount of light using a quarter of the electrical energy. Temperature is another way CFLs are cost effective. An incandescent lamp gives much more heat than a CFL. Replacing incandescent lamps with CFLs can reduce the cost of air, of air conditioning. A typical spiral type CFL is shown in figure 3-23. The large base of the bulb contains the ballast that is required for fluorescent lamps. The initial cost of the CFL is higher when compared to an incandescent lamp, but the savings are realized approximately of in approximately 500 hours of use. CFLs are designed to, for use with both AC and DC sources. The DC type is used for recreational vehicles and portable lighting that runs on batteries. The mercury vapor lamp, shown, as, shown in figure 3-24, uh, shows the construction of a typical mercury vapor lamp. It consists of two electrodes connected at opposite ends of an arc tube. The arc tube contains a small amount of mercury and argon gas. When the lamp is energized, the starting electrode generates heat to vaporize the mercury and ionize the argon. After a considerable time, the starting electrode opens, allowing the current to flow through the arc tube. The disadvantage of this type of lamp is the long delay required when starting or when the power has been temporarily interrupted. The neon lamp, shown in figure 3-25, consists of two electrodes inserted in the ends of a long glass tube. The tube is often heated and shaped into words or pictures for commercial applications. After being shaped to achieve the desired effect, the tube is filled with neon gas. A neon light transformer is used to produce a high voltage, 10,000 volts or more, which is needed to create a current through the neon gas. Because of the high voltage presence, special high voltage, voltage insulation is used to insulate the conductors after the light is energized. The neon tube will glow. Parts of the tube may be darkened out by black paint to achieve varied designs. To create the, var the variety of colors, other gases such as argon and helium can be used. Although these lamps are filled with gases other than neon, they are often referred to as neon lamps out of custom. Glow lamps. The glow lamp is very similar in construction to a neon lamp. It consists of two electrodes inside a short glass tube filled with neon or argon. The, electro the electrodes in a glow lamp are quite close in comparison to the neon light. Consequently, a glow lamp does not require the same high voltage or voltages required in typical neon light, neon signs. Strobe lamp. A strobe lamp may vary from a very short to a very long piece of glass tubing. The long strobe tubes are usually manufactured in a spiral shape, such as that shown in figure 3 26. The strobe lamp operates by discharging a high DC voltage directly through the tube. What is observed in the electrical arc flashing? What is observed is the electrical arc flashing through the tube. Sometimes there are exciters placed along the length of the tube to help attract the electrons through the long tube. Exciters are charged lengths of wire that assist the arc along the length of the glass tube. Strobes are capable of producing flashes of such great intensity that they can be used for airfield approach systems. The flash of a strobe can generate in, in excess of 50,000 watts and can be observed at distances greater than 10 miles during the light of day. Lumen. Most people, are, most people rate lighting brightness and wattage because they are familiar with the incandescent light. This is misleading 
the amount of light produced by a lamp is rated in candelas or lumens. The candela is based upon the amount of light generated by one candle. The lumen is the term used to measure the amount of light generated by lighting systems. Look at figure 3-27 to see an illustration comparing the candela and the lumen. A candela will produce 12.57 lumens at a distance of one foot from its center. A 100 watt incandescent light, the typical value you will find in your home, can produce as much as 4,000 lumens of light. The chart that follows shows a comparison of light intensities. Lumens per watt, LPW, gives the amount of light produced for each watt of energy used. The higher the LPW, the more light you will receive for each watt of energy or electricity. Edison's lamp, Edison's first lamp produced 1.4 light per lumen. Incandescent lamps produce 10 to 40 lights per lumen. Lumens per watt, that is. Fluorescent lamps produced from 35 to 100 lumens per watt. Halogen lamps produce 20 to 45 lumens per watt. Mercury vapor lamps produce 50 to 60 lumens per watt. Metal halide lamps produce 80 to 125 lumens per watt. And high pressure sodium lamps produce 100 and 140 lumens per watt. Resistors. One of the most common components encountered in the study of electronics is the resistor. The resistor is used to create a desirable The resistor is used to create a desirable voltage drop and limit current values in electronic circuitry. Figure 3-28 shows several molded composition fixed resistors. They are manufactured in many sizes and shapes. The schematic symbol for a fixed resistor is also shown. The chemical makeup that causes resistance is accurately controlled. In the resistor manufacturing process. Resistor values can be purchased in a range of values from less than 1 ohm to over 22 mega ohms or mega ohms. The physical size and material used for resistance is rated in watts. A resistor's wattage ratings rating refers to the resistor's ability to safely dissipate heat. Heat is generated by electrons flowing through the resistor. Common wattage sizes range from a quarter watt to 25 watts. Resistors are grouped in ohms and watt sizes. See figure 3-29. When purchasing a resistor, the desired resistance and wattage rating must be specified. For example, 1000 ohms and the watt size, one quarter, one half, or two watts, etc. In each watt size, the resistance value would be the same. Electrical power and wattage will be explained in detail in Chapter 4. See Figure 3-30. For example, to examine the construction of a molded composition resistor. Another type of small wattage fixed value resistor is a thin film resistor. The thin film resistor is similar to the molded composition resistor in appearance and function. However, the thin film resistor is made by depositing a resistance material on a glass or ceramic tube. A photographic process is used to deposit thin, this thin film. Leads with caps are fitted over each end of the tube to make the body of the resistor. Thin film resistors are usually color, color coded. The term Film resistor is generally used to classify very compact resistors used in microelectronics or on very small scale electronic circuit boards. Film resistors can also be referred to as surface mounted resistors or SMRs. The demand for smaller and smaller electronic devices such as cell phones created the need for small discrete components such as resistors to be manufactured in a more compact method. 
thick film and thin film are two general classifications based on how the film resistor is manufactured. Thin film deposits resistive material in, on an insulated substrate. The undesired portion is etched away leaving the desired pattern of resistive material. See figure 3-31. Thick film deposits a special resistive paste directly on the insulated sub substrate by using a stencil or silk screen process. As a result, thick film is typically a thicker deposit of resistive material as compared to thin film. The advantage of thick film is the resistor is the resistor can support higher currents and wattage than the thin film. The advantage of thin film is the smaller components requiring less heights can be made. The substrate is made from glass, ceramic, or silicone, and it is used as an insulator base for the resistor. A layer of resistor material is deposited on the substrate in a zigzag pattern precisely engineered to produce the desired resistance value. The resistor materials are made from metals or carbon mixed in a precise proprietary, proprietary, proprietary formula. The result is a thin film, which is only a few micrometers thick, or thick film, which is 10 to 50 micrometers thick. A protective coating is used to cover the resistor material deposited on the substrate. The ends of the film resistor serve as the connection terminals and are made from metal such as nickel or silver, or they can be made from an alloy. Solder is used to mount and connect the film resistor to the circuit board. See figure 3 30 the process is very similar to the same process used to manufacture integrated circuits or ICs. The process is covered more in more in more detail in chapter 19. The number stenciled directly the number stenciled directly on the surface mounted resistors indicates the resistance value. When a three digit number is used, the first two digits represent the first two digits of the resistance value, and the third digit represents the number of zeros to add to the first two digits. For example, the 202 in figure 3-32 represents the resistance value 2000 or 2K, plus or minus 5% tolerance, meaning it's allowed to vary by 5%. When four digits are used, a tolerance of plus or minus 1% exists. The four digit numbers, the same for the same for the four digit numbers, the same rule applies. That the last digit represents the number of zeros. For example, 5002 would represent 50,000 or 50k ohms plus or minus 1% tolerance. For resistance values that require a decimal, a letter R is used to indicate the decimal points. For example, 7R would represent 7.5 ohms. Film technology is not restricted to single resistors, but also may also be designed to produce resistor networks on a single chip. A resistor network consists of two or more independent resistors contained in one single surface mounted package. For higher current uses, resistors are wire wound a thin wire is wound on a ceramic core. The wire has a specific fixed value resistance. The entire component in insulated, is insulated by a coat of vitreous or opaque enamel. These resistors are shown in figure 3-33. The wire wound resistors are commonly manufactured in sizes from 5 to 200 watts. The wattage chosen depends on the heat dissipation required during operation. Metal oxide resistors are also high, used for high voltage and wattage requirements. Another type of wire wound resistor is the adjustable resistor. 
Unlike the standard wire wound resistor, the adjustable resistor is not entirely covered by enamel material. Instead, a portion, an adjustable sliding tab is attached to move across the exposed surface. This allows the resistance value to be varied. The adjustable resistors may have two or more taps for providing various resistance values in the same circuit. An adjustable resistor is and the symbol are shown in figure 3-34. Potentiometers. Most electronic equipment requires the use of variable resistance parts. A potentiometer is a very common type of variable resistor found on electronic projects. The potentiometer has a rotary knob that varies the resistance value. As it is turned, the variation in the resistance is provided by a contact that is attached to a ring of resistive material inside of the device. This device is similar to the wire wound resistor. Many potentiometers are constructed with thin wire inside of the source. Inside, as the source of resistance, various styles of potentiometers are illustrated in figure 3-35. Also shown is the potentiometer's schematic symbol. Thermistors, a special type of resistor is called a thermistor. In comparison to other types of resistors, a thermistor is unusual due to its ability to change resistance value rapidly as its temperature changes. It is commonly used to prevent high inrush currents in electrical circuits. An example of a thermistor can be seen in a, bl uh, in a blow dryer. A common blow dryer has heating elements composed of tungsten wire the tungsten wire has a very low resistance value when cold and a high resistance value when red hot. The thermistor is placed in series with the heating element to prevent a high current value. When the dryer is first turned on, as the blow dryer heats up, the resistance value goes down. The result is a very is a fairly consistent current value as the dryer heating elements changes from low resistance cold to high resistance hot. Early blow dryer models caused a dimming or flickering of lights and other electronic equipment in the home because of inconsistent current draw. The thermistor eliminates this problem. Color code Larger resistors are usually marked with their numerical resistance value printed directly on the side of the resistor. However, this type of labeling is not always practical, especially on the small resistors. The resistor color code system was developed for this purpose. The color code marking system has been adopted by the Electronics Industries Association, EIA, of the United States Armed Forces and the United States Armed Forces. This system of color coding is recognized throughout the world, referred to figure 3-36. Note how the color codes are printed or banded around the entire body of the resistor. This method of coding permits the value of, resistor, of the resistor to be read regardless of the mounting position. To see how the how to read the color coded bands referred to figure 3 37. Resistors commonly have three to four, three or four, and sometimes five bands. Each band has a unique meaning. The first band represents the value of the first digit of the resistance value. The second band represents the second digit of the resistance value. The third band is called the multiplier. The multiplier gives the factor of 10 that the first two digits should be multiplied by. The fourth band represents the tolerance of the resistor. The resistor tolerance is a reflection of the precision of the resistor's value. If a 20 ohm resistor has a 10% tolerance, the resistor's, the resistor's value can vary by 
plus or minus 2 ohms. In this case, the resistor can have a true resistance value of 18 to 22 ohms. A fifth band is, is sometimes used to indicate resistor reliability or expected failure rate. See figure 3-38. In the first sketch, the bar is red and the second bar is violet. Checking the color code chart shows the first two data to be 2 and 7 or 27. This number is then multiplied by the third band. The band is brown plus, uh, multiplied by 10. This indicates that the value 27 is multiplied by 10. For a final, for a final value of 270 ohms, this is what the resistor value would be if the resistor was perfect. However, the fourth band is silver. This indicates that the resistor has a tolerance of 10%. In this example, the tolerance is a plus or minus 27 ohms. So 200, 270 times 0.1 equals 27. Thus, the value of the resistor is sometimes between 243 ohms and 297 ohms. Work out the stated value, maximum value, and minimum value for the other two sketches in figure 3-34 on your own. For chapter summary, for chapter three summary, one conductors provide a low resistance path, while insulators provide a high resistance path. Two, four factors that affect the resistance of a conductor are length, cross-sectional area, temperature, and type of material. 3. A mil equals to 1 one thousandth of an inch. A circular mil equals the diameter expressed in mils squared or d squared for a round conductor. 5. Conductor insulation varies according to application. 6. Switches are used to control the flow of electrons through a circuit. 7. Switches are classified according to their actuator, internal electrical circuitry, poles and throws, ampacity, and voltage. 7. Excuse me. 8. Electric lamps may, be, may use filaments or ionized gas as a conductor. 9. Resistors are manufactured in many different ways, and they come in 